Present. That's a wonderful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Cindy, if you would like a snack. <laughs> oh, is it peanuts? Oh, whatever it is, I don't want it. Oh, it's... Um I did watch one of the other... And I saw them... Um
<laughs> Good morning. Let's get started. I ask Austin Scott, Austin Scott to uh, start us with a brief prayer. Austin. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may, before I say the brief prayer, I keep these words in my pocket. It's from a song from Sidewalk Prophets. So just read them real quick. Be strong in the Lord. Never give up hope. You're going to do great things. I already know. God's got his hand on you, so don't live life in fear. Forgive and forget, but don't forget why you're here. Take your time and pray. Thank God for each day. His love will find a way. These are the words I would say. If you'll bow with me just very briefly. Lord, we thank you so much for the many blessings you've given us. We know our country has a special place. You have been so generous to us. And we just pray that we would continue to find the ways to give back to those in the world that may not be as fortunate as we are. We ask that you bless this meeting, bless the leadership of this country, and bless those who are here uh, to help move this world in a direction that would be pleasing you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you. Uh, the hearing on the Committee of Agriculture entitled The Next Farm Bill, the future of international food aid and the agricultural development will come to order. Good morning and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Before we get started, uh, I want to extend our condolences to our friends at Diddy and Milling. Uh, John Diddy testified before the committee in September 2015 about the important work they are doing in milling grain into specially uh, designed food aid products. Unfortunately, one week ago today, Diddy and Milling experienced a catastrophic explosion that took the lives of three of their employees and injured several others. So our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to, uh, to the folks affected by this tragedy. As we begin our work today, this hearing builds on the work of the, that the committee did last Congress to extensively review international food aid and agricultural development programs. At the time, I was adamant that discussions about potential reforms to the programs occur during the development of the next Farm Bill, and that time has arrived. The hearing is also particularly timely, get timely given the recent release of the administration's budget proposal, which calls for drastic cuts to international food aid programs and the elimination of funding for both McGovern Dole and Food for Peace programs. I know we'll hear from several of you today about the short-sightedness of such a proposal, and I tend to agree. Americans are big-hearted folks who love seeing American, the U.S. flag on donated rice uh, and, and other U.S. commodities. As my colleague Chairman Adderholt noted, there should be no shame in using taxpayer dollars to buy American food from American farmers to send over to seas to those who literally have nothing else to eat, especially when the proposed alternative, providing cash-based assistance, can result in hard-earned taxpayer dollars being misappropriated or going directly to our agricultural competitors. International food aid programs not only contribute to jobs in the United States agricultural sector, but they also create American jobs in the manufacturing and maritime sectors as well. Eliminating such programs seems a bit contrary to the role of any robust America First policy. While less drastic than proposed elimination of these programs, I also fear that continued efforts to chip away at the core of food aid programs and to increasingly turn them into cash-based assistance program will ultimately, ultimately erode the alliance of domestic uh, ag agriculture and maritime supporters that have long advocated for these programs. That said, I recognize, as the President does, that there are efficiencies to be gained within our food aid and ag development programs. In the near term, as we approach the next Farm Bill, we take seriously the task of looking for ways to enhance the programs in a way that will build consensus and support their ongoing role in American philanthropy and in U.S. agriculture. Finally, while there are always emergency needs, the budget constraints we face are real. In the long run, these constraints will require us to increasingly focus on helping other countries make structural changes to better assist their own populations. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses today on how we can achieve these goals. And I now yield to my friend, uh, Mr. Peters, for any comments that he'd like to make. Colin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, we're here today to continue the committee's work ahead of the next Farm Bill. And I welcome today's um, witnesses to the Agriculture Committee. The United States, for more than 60 years now, has led the way in providing food for those in need around the world. Through partnerships with private organizations, millers and shippers, we have delivered more than $80 billion in domestic product benefiting hundreds of millions in need around the world since World War II. These facts and the testimony we will hear today illustrate the importance of these programs. As trade deals continue to dominate the discussion, it is worth pointing out that 11 of our top 15 trading partners in 2017 were once recipients of U.S. assistance. Unfortunately, the budget put forward by the administration would completely eliminate two key U.S. assistance programs, the Food for Peace program and the McGovern Dole program. I would urge the administration and members of Congress to consider today's testimony and to look to the work that we did as part of the last Farm Bill to improve these programs when considering potential budget cuts. 
I hope our witnesses will be able to share some examples of program successes, but also as we approach the new Farm Bill, any areas that might be in need of improvement and what changes, if any, we should consider within the next Farm Bill. So again, I thank the Chair and look forward to today's testimony and yield back. Chairman Joe's back. I want to thank our witnesses uh, today for uh, coming to our hearing. We have uh, first Mr. Ron uh, Supas from the wheat producer from uh, Dayton, Deaton, Kansas. Yes, Dayton, Kansas. Dayton, Kansas, all right. On behalf of U.S. Wheat uh, Associates, uh, Ms. Margaret Schuler, Senior Vice President of International Programs Group, World Vision, uh, United States uh, here in D.C. Uh, uh, Ms. Navin uh, Salem, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Adesia, all right, Adesia Nutrition, uh, Kingston, Rhode Island. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Brian uh, Shaneman, uh, Political Legislative Director uh, here in D.C. with Seafarers International uh, Union, AFL-CIO, and on behalf of the Maritime, USA Maritime, and uh, Mr. Thomas Jane, University Foundation Professor, Michigan State, Kalamazoo, Michigan, on behalf of the Farm Journal Federation. Uh, thank, apologize if I butchered your names too badly. I'm from West Texas, and we have a very limited pronunciation talent. So. <laughs> Mr. Zupis, you're, uh, you began in five minutes. When you uh, Mr. Chairman, a, a point of oh. order, if I may. Um, it appears that these uh, fine USAID products here uh, may require a napkin if uh, members are uh, so apted to follow Mr. Marshall's lead here that napkins may be in order for today's hearing. <laughs> so he's wearing it as opposed to eating it? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> All right. Mr. Zupis, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. I appreciate your introductions on uh, food aid between you and Mr. Peterson. I don't think I need to give my speech. I think you've taken all my talking points. Well, I uh, would still like to hear from you, though, <laughs> just for the record. At any rate, I'd like to thank you, Chairman Conway, Ranking Member Peterson, and all the members of this House Ag Committee for allowing me some of your time this morning to talk to you. I'm from western Kansas. I'm a farmer. My name's Ron Supas. I farm equal distance from Oklahoma, Colorado, Nebraska. During my lifetime, I've had a lot of opportunities to represent farmers, both Kansas and U.S. wheat farmers, but on no occasion has there been more, a more paramount topic that we need to address, and that's food security. This is a topic I think we can all agree on. You probably can't see what I'm holding in my hand, but I assure you that it's something that all respective Kansas wheat farmers don't leave home without. It's a little bit of wheat seed. Wars have been fought over this little seed. Lives have been lost. Countries have fallen because of lack of food. Food aid was designed to help curtail such happenings. The United States continues to be the world leader for food donations, and these programs give us farmers a reason to be proud. The wheat I grow is doing good halfway around the world. I recently had the opportunity to learn more about the important work by visiting Food for Progress pro projects in Tanzania. The hard red winter wheat my family produced may well have gone to the country receiving wheat from a food aid program, so I speak directly to the value of these programs to the United States and to the participating farmers. Food aid continues to matter. In the long term, it helps generate goodwill in other countries, a sentiment I saw firsthand in Tanzania. These programs also involve a significant amount of wheat, a fact not lost on Kansas farmers with full grain bins and more wheat piled on the ground from last year's historic harvest. We have enough surplus that no one should be going hungry. In the marketing year 2015-16, we sent almost 600,000 metric tons or 22 million bushels of hard red winter as food aid. That makes almost 10% of, of last marketing year's exports, and only Japan, Nigeria, and Mexico imported more hard red winter. A significant portion of these donations went to Ethiopia because the country was facing famine, and 8,000 miles away, wheat farmers in Kansas were helping prevent starvation. Monetization is an important food aid tool. The value of monetizing a commodity goes beyond the important development work it funds. Monetization creates local business opportunities and increases food availability. 
A supplementary benefit of these programs is the goodwill they foster, which can build relationships with future trade partners. Being able to go to Tanzania and talk to the NGO groups left me with a better understanding of how monetization works. Talking to farmers and other participants of the program gave me the feeling that we were doing food aid through monetization in the correct manner. I visited four of the projects funded by wheat monetization in the country and talked to the project participants. These people aren't looking for charity, but for a way to build a better life for their families and communities. And the programs aren't based on handouts. Each participant has to have skin in the game. By helping encourage agricultural development in Tanzania, we are spurring economic growth, which means Tanzania is more likely to be a stronger trading partner in the future. It is vital that the U.S. continue to fund food aid programs overseas. Farmers are unique stakeholders in the international food aid conversation, and we've been loyal partners and advocates of these programs for over 60 years. I want to see us continue our trend of excellence in providing food aid to the countries that need it most. Mr. Chairman, your leadership in this area is appreciated, and I applaud this committee's efforts to recognize the valuable role that the agriculture industry plays in international food aid. There's still so much work to feed our growing worldwide population, but I think we're on the right track and the U.S. continues to be a strong leader in helping hungry populations around the world. Thank you for allowing me to submit testimony this morning. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Schuler, five minutes. Chairman Conaway, Ranking Member Peterson, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on U.S. international food aid programs. Your continued leadership and focus on these programs is critical especially noting the unprecedented level of famine and near-famine-like conditions currently present in four countries around the world. My name is Margaret Schuler, and I'm the Senior Vice President for International Programs at World Vision. Prior to assuming this position last month, I served as the Regional Vice President in East Africa, a region currently in the grips of one of its worst food crises in decades. I have been on the ground in places like South Sudan, where millions of vulnerable people, mostly women and children, are in a day-to-day -day fight for survival. These are lives turned upside down by violence and who fled searching for safety. In many cases, families watch their children die along the way. But once they reached their destination, it was often generous food assistance from the U.S. government that allowed their remaining children to survive. As a mother, these stories break my heart. Yet I feel a sense of hope for the future when people can access the valuable nutrition they require, oftentimes renewing their dignity and hope for the future. After all, wanting your children to be healthy and thrive is one of the great equalizers in this world. Days before I left East Africa, I declared a multi-country hunger emergency at World Vision's highest level of alert. Today, 25 million people are at significant risk in four countries of that region, Somalia, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya. As we respond to these crises in East Africa and around the world, World Vision remains grateful for the support of the U.S. government to address global hunger needs including the additional funding provided through the FY 2017 Omnibus for Emergency Famine Relief. However, as we look at FY 2018 and the administration's recent budget proposal, we remain deeply concerned by the recommendations to zero out funding for both the Food for Peace program and the McGovern Dole International Food for Education and Child Nutrition program. Famines don't recognize fiscal years. We must do everything we can in the moment to keep pace with increased and growing needs, both in humanitarian, uh, humanitarian and development settings, and therefore we urge Congress to continue to robustly fund Food for Peace and McGovern Dole. Food security programming builds more prosperous and stable societies and is fundamentally aligned with America's role as a global leader. 
These programs are essential to shaping a world where our national interests will thrive. Proposals to eliminate funding for these critical accounts will have life and death consequences for the poorest people in the world and will threaten America's own safety and security in the process. While we continue to advocate for strong funding, we also stand as ready partners to improve foreign assistance so it saves more lives and uses taxpayer dollars wisely. Therefore, World Vision recommends the following measures in the upcoming Farm Bill. One, continuing this committee's strong support for the multi-year, multi-sector funding of the development food assistance activities, including a minimum of at least $350 million each fiscal year. I have personally been involved with these Title II development programs for almost 20 years. I cannot overstate how important they are to millions of people. We view this safe box programming as critical in our efforts to help countries tackle the root causes of poverty by putting people on the path to self-reliance. World Vision acknowledges the critical need for emergency food aid this year, but we also believe funding for these long-term development programs must remain a priority in the next farm, farm Bill, as they help to prevent and mitigate future food emergencies and the need for emergency assistance. Two, eliminating the minimum monetization requirement under the Food for Peace programming, program and support use of the Community Development Fund and 202E funding within Food for Peace non-emergency development programs. Three, continuing to, to provide food aid implementers discretion in using various food aid modalities, including cash transfers, vouchers, and local and regional procurement, in addition to U.S. sourced commodities. Four, affirming the Food for Peace strategy of focusing on host country government reform, which addresses root causes of poverty and food insecurity by helping people hold their governments accountable to spend U.S. assistance and domestic resources effectively and make it sustainable. World Vision understands program improvements are difficult to make, as evidenced by our evolving position on the practice of monetization. But as we review this practice further in our programming and considered it alongside other food aid options, we concluded there are often more effective processes available that would ultimately serve more communities and serve them better. Lastly, I want to reiterate that your leadership counts. We have made tremendous progress in our fight against hunger. And because of that effort, the number of hungry people has dropped by 200 million since 1992. Thank you again for allowing me to testify today. Food assistance programs are some of the most effective programs when measured by the number of people helped per U.S. dollar spent, and we cannot walk away from the poorest and most vulnerable by eliminating life-saving programs. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Yeah, the gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Salem, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Conaway, Ranking Member Peterson, and the members of the committee. My name is Naven Salem, and I am the founder and CEO of Adesia, a social enterprise on a mission to treat and prevent malnutrition for the world's most vulnerable populations. From my office in North Kingstown, Rhode Island, I can look out and see thousands of boxes run on conveyor belts outside my office on the factory floor with the familiar USAID logo and the message from the American people. This meaning, which my team of 70 has helped spread to 50 countries, holds real meaning. Inside this miracle food packet, that next time I will provide napkins for, <laughs> includes peanuts from Texas and Georgia, milk powder from Pennsylvania, New York, Indiana, and Michigan, vegetable oil from Kentucky and Maryland, vitamins and minerals from Illinois and New Jersey. What the American farmers and ranchers sow and reap what the American plants have processed with utmost regard for quality is carried across state lines from hardworking American truckers to my factory in Rhode Island so that my team can take every ingredient and turn it into an alchemy of life-saving, ready-to-use therapeutic food, or RUTF, that has the power to save lives. Allow me to share a brief story with you. A year ago, I was in a health clinic in rural Liberia passing by mothers sitting on wooden benches, waiting their turn to see the doctor. The Ebola outbreak had just ended, and a semi-sense of normalcy was returning. A young mother entered the clinic with a baby so small, I thought she wasn't real. 
I pulled her out of a long line of patients waiting to be checked by healthcare workers and placed her on a scale. She was seven months old and she weighed seven pounds. This was the same weight as my daughter Maya was the day she was born. The little girl's name was Suprice and she was quickly diagnosed with severe acute malnutrition. Someone in her, too, in her condition is too malnourished to be treated with basic foods, so I handed her this RUTF packet with the USAID logo on it. After a few bites, everyone in the clinic watched her perk up right before our eyes. And it was that miracle that I have witnessed so many times in rural clinics all over Africa. With the solution so simple, this little girl was given life and renewed hope. And thanks to the combined efforts of American farmers, manufacturers, transporters, Adesia, and USAID, she may just grow up to be one of Liberia's next leaders. I am not the typical face of a nonprofit. I solve problems through business and set goals that are sustainable, measurable, and scalable. I run a world-class advanced manufacturing, state-of-the-art, 83,000 square foot plant that creates jobs. We are laser focused on innovation and determined to save the lives of those suffering from malnutrition. We have purchased over $100 million of agricultural commodities from 15 states. We are the largest international exporter in our state. My team is busy working 24 hours a day to make life possible. Since 2010, these collective efforts have helped reach over 5 million malnourished children in partnership with USDA, USAID, UNICEF, and the World Food Program, agencies which heroically deliver this critical food aid and assistance in some of the hardest to reach, most inhospitable places on earth. It was this week, 70 years ago, June 5th, 1947, that George Marshall delivered a powerful speech. He said, our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. Hunger and insecurity are the worst enemies of peace. His words rang true, and they ring ever true now. After World War II, it was France, Italy, Germany that suffered from drought and extreme hunger. Today, as we gather for this hearing, catastrophic famines are looming in Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and Nigeria. Extreme hunger and malnutrition threaten the stability and nations of our world. If we want to fight terrorism, feeding people is the one of the most effective tools that we have to spread peace and stability. Products like RUTF not only save lives, but they build the brain trust of the next generation so that these children have the tools to study in school, to become productive members of their community, and to be our collective future. When I see a box of RUTF from Rhode Island sitting in a dusty clinic in Liberia, I am proud. I am proud because it reflects the best of American agriculture, manufacturing, and ingenuity. We in this room hold the power to continue this heroic work, which for millions of malnourished children is a matter of life and death. With strong, decisive leadership, you as representatives of the American people can show the world that there is no smarter way to put America first than by helping to feed the world's most vulnerable populations. I urge you, members of this distinguished agricultural committee, to do everything in your legislative power to safeguard international food aid, including Food for Peace, Title II. It is a true and meaningful gift from the American people. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Shaneman, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Conaway, Ranking Member Peterson, and members of the committee for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Brian Shaneman, Legislative Director for the Seafarers International Union, AFL-CIO, and I'm here today representing USA Maritime, a coalition of American vessel owners and operators, trade associations, and maritime labor. President Trump announced in his inaugural address that his administration would adopt an America First policy following two simple rules, buy American and hire American. Those words resonated deeply for those of us in America's maritime industry. Whether it was striking the first blow for independence on the high seas in 1775, braving German torpedoes in 1942, or Somali pirates in 2009, or even the natural dangers of the sea each and every day, Americans, merchant mariners, some of whom are with us in the audience today, have always answered our nation's call to bring supplies to our soldiers, commerce to our partners, and food, like Naveen talked about, to hungry people. America's humanitarian aid programs have always put America first. 
From the beginning, these programs represented the best ideals America had to offer. American food, grown in American soil and harvested by American farmers, is shipped through American ports on vessels crewed by American mariners to feed millions of hungry people, all through the generosity of the American taxpayer. This partnership has kept these programs strong for over 60 years. Yet despite that strength, for the last decade or more, these programs have been subjected to a protracted campaign to eliminate the very thing that has made them so successful, Americans. USAID, along with foreign think tanks and their fellow travelers, have done everything in their power to take America out of American food aid. Well, everything except American money. Claiming the need for added flexibility and efficiency, these so-called food aid reformers have twisted these programs. Not so long ago, the single biggest cost in the PL-480 Food for Peace program was food. Today, according to the GAO, food and ocean transport represents slightly more than one-third of the total outlays for PL-480. Added flexibility has resulted in less food aid and more cash giveaways, food vouchers, and foreign commodity purchases, all using money intended for buying and shipping American food. This is wrong. Congress should put an end to it. I can't put it any plainer than this. Food aid is essential to the American merchant marine. It is one of the largest sources of cargo for our fleet today. We've seen what happens when we lose that cargo. In 2012, Congress reduced the percentage of food aid reserved for American flagships from 75 percent to 50 percent. At the same time, USAID has been diverting money away from the purchase and shipment of U.S. commodities. The direct result has been the loss of 25 ships that is the equivalent of a quarter of our fleet since 2011. But more important than the ships, which are easily replaceable, you give me enough money, I'll buy you a ship today, is the loss of jobs. These losses represent the equivalent of over 2,400 seafaring jobs. America depends on its merchant marine to support our warfighters overseas, and without a merchant marine, we would be held hostage to foreign interests in any future conflict. The same can be said for our foreign commerce. Our merchant mariners are a vital national and economic security asset, and food aid and cargo preference help keep those mariners working in peacetime so that they are available in wartime. Without them, we cannot defend this country. It's that simple. The men and women you see with me today are apprentices from the Paul Hall Center for Maritime Training and Education at Piney Point, Maryland. They are about to embark on a new career in the maritime industry. Many of these men and women are veterans. All of them are patriots. And all of them, if they end up sailing deep sea, at some point will carry food aid. It's inevitable. We owe them a debt of gratitude for their service, not the casual slander we often see in food aid reform debates. Just yesterday, a Senate Foreign Relations Committee staffer referred to them to my face as greedy and deserving of no empathy in these conversations. They are merely an inefficiency to be removed. He was wrong. These apprentices represent the future of the merchant marine and our country, and they deserve to be treated with respect, not accused of greed or of starving children simply because they want to serve their country at sea and get paid a living wage to do it. American farmers and mariners have been the backbone of advocacy in support of these humanitarian aid programs for years. We have long warned that cutting us out of these programs would lead eventually to their repeal. And what's happened? For the first time in history, the President of the United States is openly calling for the elimination of Food for Peace and McGovern Dole. This would be a disaster for America's farmers and mariners and for hundreds of thousands, millions of people, hungry people around the world. The next Farm Bill, you all should reject the calls for elimination of these programs and return them to their America First roots. Congress should roll back the added flexibility USAID has abused. It should consider whether USAID is even, AID is even the most appropriate agency to continue implementation of these programs. USDA has run these programs for many years, and we were very pleased with our support from them, and we would love to see these programs back in USDA. I'd like to thank you all for, for allowing me to speak before you, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jane, five minutes. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Peterson, members of the committee, thank you for holding this committee, uh, this hearing today on the next Farm Bill and the future of international food aid and ag development. Much of my statement today will reflect policy recommendations that appear in a brief that I co-authored uh, in work that the Farm Journal Foundation has commissioned and released earlier this year. It's on the web. So I'm not going to go into too many details on recommendations now because of the time. But what I would like, to, my basic message, Mr. Chair, is very simple. 
It is that the U.S. agricultural development assistance is in the U.S. national interest, creates jobs in the U.S. and win-win situations both here at home and overseas. So I'm going to try, I'm going to divide this into two pieces. I first like to explain all of the various ways in which that win-win occurs and why it's in the United States' interest to continue to promote U.S. ag development assistance. And then secondly, to go into a little bit about how uh, taxpayer money spent on this could be actually made more effective and create actually greater win-wins for the U.S. and for, uh, for our uh, partners overseas. So first of all, why should the United States, you know, use taxpayer money to promote agricultural development in, in developing regions like Africa? Well, as most of you, I'm sure, know, uh, the population growth in the world over the next several decades is going to occur basically outside our borders. Africa is a place right now that is growing rapidly. The population in Africa today is one billion, but in 30 years it's going to be two billion people and it's account for 24 percent of the world's population. This is where the demand for agricultural products is growing most rapidly. And so it's in our interests to convert those two billion people from food aid recipients into people who have the purchasing power to demand food and, will, and, and to encourage greater stability in the world and greater trade and investment uh, between uh, developing regions and ours. The potential for job growth over the next decade in the U.S. agribusiness and uh, farm growth is, is very clear. All of the research evidence that's been done on this uh, points it in the direction that it is uh, very much in our interests to promote agricultural development uh, in developing countries. Um, Nigeria, a country that used to be a big food aid recipient, now is the third largest uh, importer of U.S. wheat. Ghana, uh, in the top 10 rice importers of uh, U.S. products. And Angola is the fourth largest importer of broiler meat from the U.S. So this, these are just examples of how U.S. agribusiness and farmers can benefit from rising incomes in the third world. So now why is it in our interest to promote agriculture? Why agriculture in particular? Well, in countries, in, in regions like Africa where 70% of the population is engaged in farming, it is very, the best way to promote income growth most effectively is to help develop those 70% of the population so that they have a little bit more money in their pockets and when they start spending that money, they're spending it on all manner of non-farm goods as well as food. And this is what accelerates the transition of developing countries from agrarian societies into um, non-farm, you know, diversified economies that are more uh, plugged into world trade. And so the potential here for win-wins with U.S. agribusiness and farmers cannot be uh, overemphasized. A second major advantage to promoting U.S. Uh, ag development assistance is because it promotes peace and stability. And many of the f uh, prior speakers have emphasized this. Uh, I, I recall hearing uh, General Mattis on the television program uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago talk about how uh, each dollar spent on, effective dollar spent on U.S. ag development assistance can actually avert the need for five times more money on bullets and military expenditures down the line to quell civil unrest down the road. Uh, and it can also avert the need for humanitarian disaster assistance of much greater proportion. So uh, it could be money well spent from the standpoint of promoting peace and stability and averting future costs that the U.S. might need to incur. The third uh, reason why it's a win-win for us is because it promotes soft power. The United States, it projects soft power uh, around the world for the United States. And I think many of you, uh, you know, understand that, that, uh, that the goodwill that's created by U.S. assistance uh, cannot be overemphasized. China certainly uh, understands this well, too. And uh, you might know that about 1,000 Africans each year are educated in Mandarin, and then after they become fluent in Mandarin, are brought back to China to participate in advanced degree training in China. Then they come back 
to fill uh, high-level positions in governments, in African governments, and in the private sector in Africa. And as you can imagine, uh, the uh, influence that those people have in determining future trade relations, future private sector investment, and so forth, uh, you know, is going to be quite, quite significant. So we wouldn't want to wake up 10 years from now uh, finding that many of our opportunities to invest in Africa and to derive benefits from trade relations in Africa are locked up to us because of uh, foresight of other countries to, you know, uh, develop these inroads while we don't do that. Um, so there's three reasons. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you go to... Uh, Dr. Jane, I'm going to have to ask you that. We're okay. way over time. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Chair, would re uh, <coughs> like to remind members that they will be recognized for questioning in order of seniority for members who are here at the start of the hearing. After that, members will be recognized in order of arrival. I appreciate uh, members' understanding. I now recognize, recognize myself for five minutes. This, this is the face of five little girls eating lunch on the, or breakfast at the uh, McGovern Dole program. Uh, had an opportunity to go to this uh, school in Ethiopia, Daradaba, uh, last May, May of 16, to see these programs and work. Uh, we got to watch these little girls uh, eat. Uh, they get to take, if they go to school a certain number of days in the month, they get to take an extra ration of uh, oil home with them to their families. They got them an incentive so the fa families keep these little girls in school. We went from this program to a uh, mountainous region where final distribution point for uh, food, emergency food aid, to uh, watch that process being to hap uh, happening. Uh, watched a slightly built young uh, fella, uh, two other big fellas, dropped a 110 pound sack of rice on his back. He kind of slumped under it, walked over to his donkey, put it on there, came back for the, for the other food that he was getting. And at least for the next several days, uh, that family would not go hungry. Uh, and these little girls would not be hungry either. The entire time I was there, I'm thinking about the wonderful stuff we're doing. This is really good stuff. The, uh, these kids are eating, uh, they're going to school. It was also niggling in the back of my mind the entire time. Uh, David was with me, uh, Lamalfa was with us as well, that uh, we, have, we have mortgaged our own children's future doing good things. And that one of these days we may face a very daunting challenge of how do we continue to do the good work we're doing here, but also respect uh, the challenges and the, and the threats to our own long-term survival of this country with $20 trillion in debt uh, and growing, and how do we continue to do those? And one of these days, either me or somebody in this position is going to face those hard choices uh, to, uh, to, to decide between American children and Americans and, uh, and the great work we're doing overseas. And it's, uh, it's going to require the, the wisdom of Solomon to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, at least, uh, you know, this president has, uh, has uh, highlighted that with his budget. I disagree with, uh, with the, what he's done, but we are now talking about it in much more meaningful terms than we were before the uh, submission of that budget. And that's important that we do this because we're going to have to make hard choices between good stuff. The easy stuff that we shouldn't spend money on, that's just going to go away. But we're going to have to make hard choices between the good stuff. Dr. Jane, I cut you off a little bit a second ago. How can we move toward uh, self-sufficiency in countries uh, versus continuing to do the emergency aid, the food, feeding them for today, but how can, how can countries uh, move, what can we do uh, in lieu of just continuing to provide food that allow these countries to transition to uh, self-sufficiency? Mm, okay, well, Mr. Ch thank you. Uh, we've made progress uh, over the last decade or two on this, and you can see a progressive uh, weaning of uh, developing countries off of food aid and uh, as, they, as they develop. So more of the same, uh, but it is possible to uh, make our development assistance even more effective than it has been, uh, and that is by emphasizing the same kind of uh, agri the d development of local agricultural institutions, much in the same way that the United States 150 years ago and its farmers benefited from the USDA uh, cooperative extension program, the land-grant universities that w worked on crop science and developed new varieties for farmers. These are the nuts and bolts kinds of investments that we can be using to develop those countries and, and wean them off of the need for food aid. 
in your testimony, you mentioned AgriCore. Would you brief the group as to what AgriCore does uh, in uh, Dr. Jane? Uh, I don't think it was me who said AgriCore, uh, Chair. Oh, all right. Well, somehow it said. Well, then I'll tell about AgriCore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. AgriCore is a, a, a privately funded uh, group of uh, young men and women who graduate from our universities with uh, uh, ag uh, agriculture degrees. Sure. Uh, they've grown up on farms, and this group sends them to, they're in Guyana, Ghana, uh, and they're now in Liberia this year, uh, setting up 4-H programs in these schools. The, uh, the one we visited, uh, uh, the elementary, the junior high school, which is as far as it can go in Ghana, the, that's uh, uh, their programs of, of learning how to, to, uh, to grow things and, and make money, supports um, four scholarships to uh, high school. Uh, under this 4-H program, and when 4-H started there, the pregnancy rate among uh, young great, uh, 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 middle school kids was something like 60%. Uh, today, the kids participating in 4-H, the pregnancy rate is zero. So good programs being done. This is no, no taxpayer dollars involved, uh, just a program coming out of Throckmorton, Texas, where uh, some local folks decided we need to, to spread that 4-H program. You mentioned the uh, extension programs. Uh, to, uh, to Ghana and uh, in Liberia, so good stuff going on. With that, I recognize uh, Mr. Peterson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, as you guys have noted, uh, you know, the World Food Program and Famine Early Warning System predicts these four famines this year. And some of you have alluded to this in your testimony, but if you have experience, any of you, in the current conditions in these countries, um, could you give us your perspective of what is happening on the ground? I think some of you did this to some extent, but if you could elaborate a little more specifically of what's going on on the ground and, and then how these programs are going to be used to try to alleviate that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So I can speak to uh, the situation in East Africa. As I said, I just came from East Africa. And, um, and there were four countries in particular that were at a crisis level. So Somalia, Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan, and Somalia. South Sudan and, and, and Somalia actually had declared or were in at famine stage. Um, so people and children were already dying in those countries. Um, the situation in South Sudan is dramatic. Um, you know, in many places, because of the violence and, um, and um, just the general um, crisis situation and, and um, insecurity in that country, it's very difficult even to deliver food aid into certain places. So there's food drops, for example, that happen. And I actually was out there a couple months ago and saw a team of, of our staff from World Vision who had just come back from the field. And these guys are out in the field waiting for those food drops so they can ensure that that food gets to the most vulnerable people. Um, but, and, and in Somalia, the, the same situation, World Vision and other, other development actors are on the ground implementing programs with, with Title II resources um, and, and in partnership with WFP that often uses U.S. government uh, food, food resources. Um, these programs are critical. They're a critical piece of, of our programming in, in response to this, uh, this famine in East Africa. And what's beautiful is that um, uh, there's, a, there's a general um, effort by everyone to, to bring in more resources from the U.S. government. Um, but we also have a lot of private citizens around the U.S. that also bring in uh, private resources, care about f people on the ground who are, who are starving, care about children. And when we talk about the fact that we, we partner with the U.S. government to provide food aid, um, you know, they like that. They feel there's leverage there um, and that it's a partnership. So um, I would just urge us, there's, there's 25 million people in East Africa alone at risk of starvation and um, food insecurity. And these programs are important today. Um, those people will, many of those children will starve if we cut these programs. Thank you. Um. Yeah, is the uh, basis for this coming from these programs? I mean, the folks that are using, we're getting this out into the countryside, are they, is this um, food that we've shipped under the Food for Peace program and then the 
they're the ones trying to get it out into the country? Is that how it's working? Or? I mean, certainly in Ethiopia, I'll give an example of Ethiopia, a country that I've worked in for almost 20 years. Um, in Ethiopia, and you, you mentioned that you've recently visited Ethiopia. Um, uh, fantastic progress has been made in Ethiopia um, because of a program like the Joint Emergency Program that a number of P PVOs are a part of. It's an emergency food uh, assistance program um, led by Catholic Relief Services. And, um, and there's also quite a large um, Title II uh, development program in that country. And so in these places where there's severe food insecurity and possibility of, of famine, uh, the, the Title II program is, is being implemented and that food is going to people in that country right now today through that JOP and through the Title II uh, development program to, um, with the, with the JOP it's for more emergency food assistance. Uh, with the Title II development program, this is trying to mitigate the impact of future, uh, future disasters um, by building resilience in the communities. So absolutely, Title II programming is, is supporting these, in, is being, um, so helping uh, organizations like World Vision deliver food to, to very vulnerable people in these countries. Yield, yield back. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's, uh, thanks for having this hearing. I think it's important. I think if you look back at history, what the American reaction after World War I and versus what we did after World War II at the Marshall Plan, it paid much dividends, I think, uh, our food for peace and all that work we did. Um, Mr. Shoneman, uh, you commented about it used to be, uh, I guess, USAID's budget, uh, most of it went for food and, and transportation. Now it's about a third. Can you expound a little bit about what's, what's, what's occurring there, Lynn? Sure. I think, I think what we're seeing is uh, the, the constant push for added flexibility that, that folks in, in the reform community have been trying to make has eaten up a large portion of the, of the funding that goes to Title II. Uh, in my written testimony, if you take a look at it, um, about a quarter of what we spend on outlays for Title II is going to buy commodities. Less than 10 percent goes on ocean freight. Less than 10 percent is inland freight in the United States. 60-some percent of it, 20 percent, uh, including the lockbox funding, is, is, is 202E, which in the 2014 Farm Bill was plussed up and increased, and almost all of that increase has gone to cash programs and food voucher programs and, and local regional purchase. Uh, and then you've got a, a huge amount of money that's going for inland uh, transportation, storage, and handling. Now, that, that doesn't make any sense to me, and I think GAO highlighted that in their last report. <laughs> because ITSA should be going down if the amount of Title II American food is being reduced in country because that's only supposed to be used to move and, and warehouse American food. So I have a hard time trying to figure out why the numbers are looking the way that they're doing, particularly as commodity prices have been going down. Um, so I think at the end of the day, we really need better oversight. Well, I, I, USA I, 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 I guess I'm, I'm confused. The, the, the cash payments are going to buy commodities here in this country, or they're going to commodities elsewhere? Well, elsewhere. elsewhere. That, that's okay. the, I mean, that, GAO's last report basically said that of the increase that was, that was given, the added flexibility given to USAID in the 2014 Farm Bill, something like 90 percent in the last year was, of that increase, went to cash assistance, food voucher programs, local regional purchase, not buying American commodities. Because we're still hurting American farmers, American agriculture. Correct. And that's, that's the biggest issue. I mean, and, and Chairman Conaway pointed this out. You know, when we do these local regional purchase programs, I understand that, that there's a need for it and we support some flexibility. But we've got to keep in mind, farmers, American farmers compete internationally yeah. and this is a global market. So every dollar that an American taxpayer sends overseas to buy foreign food is not a dollar being spent here in the United States. It's not economic activity in the United States. It's not cargo that's going to be shipped on an American ship coming out of Texas uh, or anywhere in the Gulf. So that, that's a big issue for us, and that's, that's why we're really concerned with the way the program has been going. Uh, another thing I want to make sure it's highlighted, you, you mentioned in your testimony, the cargo preference, and I guess it would be the Jones Act too, uh, having, our having a, a viable merchant marine industry and the impact it has when we have to, uh, uh, they're, they're at the beck and call of the Defense Department when emergency, and I guess the, the best example probably was uh, when we kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, um, what the Merchant Marine did to haul all that equipment over there and uh, the cost that we would have to, for the United States Navy to maintain those kind of ships to be available every once in a while when, need, when needed would be a lot more. So I think that's an important uh, 
point that needs to be made that people don't quite understand. And, uh, and he highlighted the cargo preference uh, keeps the merchant marines um, uh, operating because of that. So you want to expound a little bit on that? Sure. I, Congressman Gibbs is absolutely right. I mean, the, the bottom line, a, a ship is like a car, and cargo is like gasoline. If you don't have cargo, the ship doesn't move. If you don't have gas, the car doesn't move. So you can buy as many ships as you want. You can have them sitting up tied next to the quay. If there's no cargo to keep them commercially viable in peacetime, then my members aren't sailing, they're not making money, the companies aren't making money, and all this is is a drain on the taxpayer. So the, the whole point of cargo preference is to provide a cargo base that is, is of things we are already buying and already shipping anyway. It's not like we're going out of our way to buy stuff that we don't need to send it over to Africa or Asia or even defense cargo. We're, we're taking stuff that we're already going to buy and we're just requiring it to be moved on U.S. ships, and that way we provide the cargo base that keeps my members working. That's critical, and if we don't have that, Merchant Marine goes away, and that's why these programs have been around since 1904 and 1954, Thank respectively. You. I'm almost out of time, but uh, uh, Ms. Salem, I'm just curious, what's the cost of a packet like this? Or, you know, well, It's interesting you bring that up because, um, you know, as running a business, one of our most important things is to look at costs. And since we started this um, just eight years ago, the cost of these packets has gone down dramatically. So whereas a box used to cost $55, we're now down to $38. And that's due to efficiencies, economies of scale, et cetera. So per, per packet, it's about 30 cents. OK. Right. Thank you. And time's out. I yield back. Ms. Fudge, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all so much for being here today. You know, with leadership comes responsibility. If, in fact, we are the leaders of the world, we need to take some responsibility, if indeed we still are. Of all the things we could cut, we would cut food. We have become complicit, or will become complicit, uh, in the starvation of hungry women and children. How many guns do we need? How much ammunition do we need? It is immoral, it is heartless, and it is not even strategic for our world relations. It cuts jobs in this country. It is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. If we are leaders, it comes with some responsibility. Um, Ms. Shul, the McGovern Dole program does provide agricultural commodities to reduce hunger and promote literacy. For young girls in these developing countries, the program has shown some additional benefits. Could you address that, please? Um, thank you. Um, so the McGovern Dole program is a, is a really smart and um, important program. We have, I'll give you an example of a, a McGovern Dole program that we have in Mozambique. Um, it, 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 um, it supports thousands of children to go to school and, and supports school feeding for those children. And, and the, the outcomes then are improved nutrition for those children, more girls in school, and improve literacy rates. So it is one of the most critical programs that we can, we can do. We all care about the well-being of children around the world. And the programs I've seen that improve literacy rates, for example, you know, it's amazing what you find when kids can read. And parents, they're, they're peer, you ask the kids, can you read? And they, they hold up their book, and they, they're so proud that they can read. And their parents are peering in the window. And I've seen this all over Africa. This is a fantastic way to spend our money. So being able to go to school, having good nutrition, it helps learning outcomes. It's a fantastic and important way to use US government resources. Thank you very much. And I'm really not going to ask any other questions. I just want to close with this. When we question the viability of NATO, when we no longer want to be in the Paris Accord, uh, when we pick fights with mayors that we don't need to pick fights with. Mm -hmm. At some point, it will not be America first, it will be America alone. I yield back. M Madam, if you would yield just a moment to me. Right here. Oh. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Schuller, just when you talked about literacy, besides just the pride, 
what economically happens in African countries, in African um, villages, when women, and particularly girls, um, are educated and read economically, not just in sense of pride? You know, educating women and girls is one of the most important things that we can do in Africa to build communities, to build households. So oftentimes, if you think of a household, the women in a household in Africa are often responsible for, for management of that household, like, like in many, many places. Um, and so if you have uneducated women and poorly, um, poorly educated women, they're less able to... Um, to manage their household in terms of economics, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but they're also um, less able to keep their children healthy, um, less able to understand how to keep their family healthy. Um, but oftentimes, when women are more educated, they're able to start, um, if, if, for example, if you can link them with a microfinance program, they're able to start a small business. And, um, and, and when you give a woman a loan, it, boy, she'll take that and she will do something fantastic with that. And, um, and, and we've seen that in so many cases where educated women, educated girls have stronger households, better economy in the household, um, are able to have small businesses and to thrive. And that helps the overall economy of the country. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, um, Congresswoman, for yielding to me, because if we don't want to be take on the responsibility, at le least let's just be strategically smart about this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I comment on Ms. Schuler's comments? Yes. Uh, I saw what she's talking about firsthand in our visit to Tanzania pertaining to the ladies, the women. Probably 70 percent of the farmers there, maybe 65 percent, are women. Uh, the bankers, they're not from, the, from Tanzania, the bankers are like Finca and, and some of these organizations, prefer to deal with the ladies. Uh, the ladies are uh, more comprehensive. Uh, they're probably more apt to repay their loans. Uh, one, one individual lady there um, had been in the program for 19 years, I believe, and they start out by being loaned basically $200, pretty high interest rate, and they're expected to pay it back. But this lady was able to acquire an acre or two and get it paid for. She was able to send her children through school. Doesn't cost much, but it costs a lot there in relationship to their dollar. So I'd like to verify what she's been talking about. Uh, the women are kind of running things over there. Whether that's good or not, I'm not sure. But. Yeah. <laughs> The lady sounds expired. Uh, Mr. Scott, five minutes. Well, I, I don't know if you intended to destroy any future political career, but you just did. Yours, not ours. Uh, Ma'am, Miss uh, Salem, we have a gentleman named uh, Mark Moore, uh, who in uh, 2009 founded MANA in uh, Fitzgerald, Georgia where they manufacture a very similar product. Uh, I shared that product with uh, one of the finest men I've ever met, General Kelly at the time, now it's Secretary Kelly, uh, discussing, um, as we were discussing, the importance of these types of programs through, throughout the world. Uh, he, he had one suggestion on the package, so this is from someone who, who knows what they're talking about, not me. Uh, and the MANA package had the same USAID symbol on it is that um, the American flag should probably be more prominently displayed uh, on the package. Just a suggestion from someone. I've made that same suggestion to, to others as well. Because it, while I'm, I'm glad, as Ms. Schuler said, the education is improving, many people can't read the packages. And the American flag is a, it's a global symbol for good. And uh, in any way, it could be more prominently displayed. Uh, I, I would appreciate. Okay. And, I've yeah, I've, and those decisions are made strictly by USAID. So uh, we're taking direction from from uh, the higher ups at USAID. So we'll give USAID a little instruction then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do appreciate what you do. I think it's an extremely important mission, and. Um, thousands, if not millions, of people have, have benefited from 
from the work of, of you and, uh, and organizations like MANA and the people that, that volunteer their time. I'm um, very familiar with Merchant Marines. My uh, father-in-law was a Merchant Marine. I have been to uh, Kings Point. Um, I had the discussion with the Navy uh, this past week about the value of our Merchant Marines and um, certainly extremely concerned that over the last several years, while there are 10,000 more ships in the fleet uh, worldwide, that the U.S. fleet is down by about 30% to 169 of the 41,674 merchant vessels in the world. So please don't take this question as anything other than just asking for the facts. How much more does it cost us to ship it on a U.S. flagged vessel than it would cost on a non-U.S. flagged vessel? That is a very difficult question to answer because... I would just mean container to container. Well, I, you know, it, that's, that's the problem. It, it changes every day. Um, I would say if I had to ballpark it and somebody's going to yell at me for saying this even, I'd say maybe 10% more. But at the end of the day, the, the, the economic benefit and, and the value to the taxpayer way outweighs whatever that differential would be. We, we cannot win a fight overseas if we cannot get our equipment there. Um, it, Ms. Schuler, is it your is that the calculation? Ten percent more that um, other people would is that number approximately? I, I don't have that number uh, calculation. I do know that currently half of food aid budget is spent on shipping and related costs. And so, for the, for my, my comment on on just efficiency and ensuring that we work together to look for. Uh, ways to get the most resource to the people in need. If I, if I can well, comment on that briefly, uh, Congressman uh, Scott. Just we to we have to maintain the merchant marine fleet. Period. We do. And just that's, to be clear, the, the, the shipping amount, the amount of money that goes to shipping, uh, that, that's, it's, it's easy to conflate that because that includes everything. That's not just the ocean side, which is about 8.2%. That includes the inland freight in the United States. It includes all of the all of the getting and transporting and handling of the materials in country that we would that would that, that would be charged no matter who or where we source the products from. So at the end of the day, it's, it's always going to cost some kind of money to get these products from the port into the hands of folks. I just want to make clear that you know at least on the ocean side, we are a minuscule compared to the amount of money that the overall program has. I, I, I would be interested in seeing the calculations. Uh, and, and again, I recognize and had this discussion with the highest levels in the in the Navy this past week, literally about the value of the Merchant Marine Academy. So, with that said, uh, let me just thank you for what you do. It's an important part of who we are as America, and uh, I look forward to continuing to support you. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the 13 seconds. The chairman yields back. Uh, Mr. McGovern, five minutes. Th thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a letter sent to us uh, from 100 plus Christian leaders urging that we support these international food aid programs. Without objection. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. I, uh, I appreciate your thoughtful and insightful testimony. Um, I am encouraged by the support you've all expressed for our international food programs. Uh, uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful for your support for Food for Peace and McGovern Dole, and, um, and you all kind of represent very different perspectives. Uh, and so let me say I agree with you. Um, and um, you're right. Uh, these are all important programs. And like you, I've seen many of these programs up close and personal, uh, firsthand. I've witnessed U.S. NGOs, humanitarian aid workers, and our own USDA and USAID uh, field officers responding on the, you know, uh, on the ground uh, with emergency food and water and medical attention to uh, deal with uh, masses of refugees fleeing violence or natural disasters or drought or what have you. And, uh, but their courage and compassion and their professional expertise uh, you know, just takes my breath away. The parents send more girls to school. And it's, you know, and they're incredibly successful. I've had mothers come up and thank me uh, when I visited McGovern Dole programs, thank the people of the United States for what they're doing. I remember I was in Columbia many years ago visiting a McGovern Dole program, and a mother came up to me and introduced me to her 11-year-old son and said that in every day in this, you know, terrible slum they were living in, one of the uh, armed actors comes through the neighborhood asking this mother to give up her 11-year-old son so he can join one of the armed groups. And she says, and they say to her that I, we can give him something you can, and that's we can feed him. And because of the programs that, uh, that the United, U.S. taxpayers support, this mother can now send her kid to school. He's getting fed. 
and he's going to learn to read and write, and maybe be a leader uh, in that country. And she said, supposed to thank the people of the United States. Uh, and I just have this kind of radical idea that that kind of stuff is good for us. Uh, it's good for our national security. When people like you, they don't want to blow you up. I mean, it's, you know, but, uh, but yet we have the, we're having this, this crazy battle now uh, with the president's budget. And I'm sorry, it is heartless. Uh, it is reckless. Uh, it is self-defeating and it is stupid. Why would we even go after these programs that, that not, you know, not only deal with a humanitarian crisis, but actually help us? So I'm grateful to the farmers who grow the food. I'm grateful to the railroads, the truckers, the port workers who help transport and, and warehouse uh, commodities and other supplies, to the shippers, uh, the U.S. Merchant Marines, to everybody who transport uh, our food around the world, uh, to all the NGOs and humanitarian aid workers. I think nothing could be more uh, in the immediate and long-term national security interest as well as our economic and social interests uh, of the United States. You know, and I, um, you know, I, 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 I tell people all the time that hunger is a political condition. We can eliminate it. You guys all have ideas how to eliminate it. It's we don't have the political will. And we shouldn't be debating. We should be debating about how we enhance this. I mean, this is ridiculous that we're talking about cutting it or eliminating it. I'm embarrassed, quite frankly, that a budget like this is before us. But let me, since this is supposed to be, the president's budget is supposed to be a national security budget, let me throw the question out to you. I mean, uh, you know, how, how do you view these programs as contributing to the U.S. national security uh, interests, uh, both in the immediate and the long term? Anyway, yeah, Mr. Jane. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have some. Uh, there are many ambassadors of goodwill, and they're promoting development at the same time. Uh, those programs are, really need to be expanded uh, in order to uh, promote a win-win situation. Right. I think it gets to the point that, look, uh, extreme poverty and hunger lead to chaos and war and conflict. Um, this is where terrorists go, you know, to find recruits. Uh, and, you know, it's in our national security. Uh, Ms. Shula? Yeah, just speaking about Somalia, which I'm more familiar with, in East Africa, um, you know, you know, Somalia is a place where the U.S. government and, and it, with its, its colleagues in Ethiopia and other countries are trying to um, reduce the threat of al-Shabaab. And, um, and by supporting programs like this, we have, a, we have an OFDA and Food for Peace emergency program in Somalia. You know, you can imagine, we're feeding people, we're supporting people, they're getting to know, uh, know us as, as the good heart of America. And um, you can imagine that people would join those terrorist groups if they had nothing. Yeah. Like you said, they, they have nothing. So what, what are they, you know, they might be enticed with something else. But um, these programs make a difference in places like Somalia, and it directly, um, you know, reduces the influence of uh, al-Shabaab. And, and reduces the number of people that will join those terrorist groups. Well, thank yeah, you very much. This is worth General fighting for. Thank you. General Stav expired. Um, Mr. Crawford, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> um, Ms. Schuler, in your testimony uh, from USA Maritime mentions that uh, continued reforms to existing food programs could actually damage the program's credibility and, credibility and domestic support over time. Is that concern to World Vision? <laughs> Thanks. I'm in the middle here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for World Vision and for many humanitarian organizations, our number one objective is to improve the well-being of the poorest people in the world. And so, you know, that's kind of where we focus our efforts. And what's beautiful about this Title II program, for example, and I've, I've been involved in this program for years in different ways, both at headquarters and also in the field, is the partnership that we have between, you know, NGOs, shippers, um, farmers, uh, government, and, and it's just a really nice partnership. If you've ever been to Kansas City and the meetings there, it's just a nice feel. It's a good partnership. Um, but, you know, the program's been going uh, for, for 60 years. Uh, it's, it, it's always good to look at uh, constant improvement and review. And so for us, we just believe that all these parties that are partnering should get together and look at ways to improve the way we do business and, um, and, you know, and reform the system if necessary so that we can get m the most resource to the most uh, people. And, and that's really uh, what we hope. We would never hope that those efforts to improve efficiency would result in a cutting of the program overall. That would never be our intent. But, um, but I think it's good business to look at reviewing and improving as necessary. Um, Congressman Crawford, if I could uh, throw in there just the, the, 
benefit and, and the advocacy that farmers like Ron and mariners like my guys sitting in the back row here have provided over the years puts a, a human face, an American face, on a program that otherwise could be char characterized as just another excuse for Americans to run up the credit card to give away money to people overseas. That's, that's I've, I've heard that, that phraseology used about programs like this, and it's completely wrong. And that's what makes this program so good. As Chairman Conway pointed it out, we're $20 trillion in debt. So if we're going to be spending money on these programs, we've got to be spending it in the best way possible, in a way that helps to provide an economic and a political benefit at home, not just overseas. And that's what this program has always done. And that's why you've got American mariners, you've got American farmers coming up here hand in glove, working together to make sure that this program stays viable. And that's why it has for 60 years. And if we cut American farmers out, if we cut American mariners out of these programs, then all we're going to have left is a check. Right. And checks don't vote. Well, let me just say I'm 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 for PL 480. I'm I'm for these programs, and but I, I want to make a distinction between those commodities that we use as a part of these programs versus cash, which is oftentimes a, a point of debate. So my point being this: uh, cash has a habit of turning into things that these programs weren't designed for. So what I'd like to find out is is um, you know the GAO has indicated cash assistance can be susceptible to fraud and abuse. Um, have any of your organizations implemented any kind of protections um, to combat that type of uh, phenomenon from taking place? Because I agree with you, I want to get I want to get nutrition to people who need it, but I don't want to put cash in the hands of people who might use that against the folks uh, that need our assistance. Any comments there, Ms. Salem? Yeah, I mean, I th I think it's it's kind of ironic that this is the program that we're threatening to to cut because most of the countries in the world are giving cash and the U.S. is the one who is holding on to trying to keep the Americans in mind when we are adding these uh, items to the budget. And so it, it's a very, uh, it's a program that's very much in our own self-interest. And so to me it's kind of ironic that, that it is slated to be um, deleted from, from the budget. Um, I mean, in the field, we are always uh, able to monitor very closely uh, what products are where, how much they're getting used. We're doing monitoring and evaluation everywhere to make sure that we're seeing actual outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and I just also want to say that while sometimes we feel like the world is falling apart and we have famines and we have all of these issues, like overall, we are trending in the right direction, that these 60, 70 years of these policies have dramatically increased the state of the world. We used to have two billion people who lived under $2 a day. Now we have a billion. That's a massive improvement. When I got started in this business, we had five million children who would die from severe acute malnutrition every year. It's down to three. That's just in seven years. So these programs and all of these efforts that all of us at this table are working on are working. And we are, we are trending in the right direction. And we are, are, are making a big dent in, in changing these lives. So we can't stop now. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Stavage, Mr. Evans, five minutes. I'd like to ask this question of everyone at the table. As we head into consideration of the Farm Bill expiring in September of 2018, what would each of you set forth as top issues for consideration? Okay, thank you, Mr. Evans. Um, there are certain, uh, any kind of program that helps to build capacity locally so that there's sustainable capacity uh, being developed in developing countries that will encourage these countries to become more committed to private trade uh, and investment, that will always be a win-win for them and for the United States. So in general terms, any kind of program that's going to support those objectives should be nurtured. And my colleagues here, I'm sure, will agree with me that even though there's always going to be a need for food aid when there's disasters, by far the preference, both here as well as uh, in developing countries, will be to help uh, them become self-sufficient, as the chair mentioned earlier, and to become a more commercial partners rather than dependent disaster partners. Anything that promotes that objective, I think, would be in our interests. Congressman Evan, I think uh, the, the point that I made earlier, at least for us, our, our biggest goal would be that 
whatever changes or reforms that, 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 that the uh, uh, Congress is looking at in the Farm Bill. We focus on returning Title II, PL 480, to the, to the program that it was and always has been, which is an in-kind program that's designed to get food in the hands of hungry people. I think we have enough flexibility, we've done enough tinkering in all of these programs over the last 10 years to give AID and, and other folks the, the flexibility they need in other accounts with different pots of money that they can use to uh, address immediate issues that they need and that this program should remain an in-kind program. And the other thing I would say is this committee needs to do oversight on USAID. I know they're not within your jurisdiction, but get it back because our biggest, our biggest concern, when I look at some of these numbers, they just don't make any sense to me. And if they're not making sense to me, I'm sure they're not making sense to you. And I'd like to hear for, from, from USAID directly, you know, where are, their, where, are their, where are their controls? Where's the transparency? Where is the accountability? Because I don't want to see any of, the, any of the funds that are supposed to go to buy food and supposed to go into the, in the hands of, of kids ending up where it's not supposed to be. And we all can take a wild guess where that would be. Um, I would echo the, you know, Food for Peace Title II um, programs that we are currently working in. Um, the products that we make are evidence-based, and this was done in collaboration with USAID, who commissioned a study through Tufts to make sure that our American food aid basket was the best that's there, and that we're really looking at very what the issues are on the ground and then delivering evidence-based solutions for that. And so... I think you all have a, a before and after picture that I submitted with our written testimony. That picture and that transformation is proof that this is the impact that we can make. That is as evidence-based as, as I can think of, uh, and that's as measurable as I can think of. And to, to watch children be able to transform like that in a six-week period from near death to running around and, and playing like a two-year-old should, those are, the, those are important programs of Food for Peace. We're, proud to have been partners with them um, to make this uh, impact um, significant. Yeah, thank you. As per my, my testimony, I'll, I'll reiterate, but maybe give a little context. So continuing to fund the, the multi-year, multi-country development programs is critical. So in years like this, even though there's emergencies, you still need that development programming um, the long-term program to prevent and kind of mitigate these emergencies. So that is just a critical piece of what we do, building resilience in households and in communities for longer-term sustainability. Um, that's that's got to continue. That would be uh, something we would like to say. And then also, um, com I think this idea of continuing to leave a little bit of flexibility in the way that we program. So programming with cash or vouchers or um, um, commodity, uh, in different contexts, you might need different ways of programming and to reach different, uh, different um, groups of people at, at different times. So I think this idea that it's all commodity-based maybe is not the best way to look at it, and that, that is something that we would like to see a little bit more flexibility in the way that we use the resources. And then, as I said, eliminating the minimum monetization requirement um, because it's costly and often uh, an inefficient uh, way to do, do business. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Lucas, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize for having stepped out briefly for another committee hearing. My neighbor up in Kansas, could I turn to you for a moment? And I realize that this question's already been asked. I apologize, but let's expand on it for a moment. When we send uh, actual commodity out into the food programs out into the world, there are certain quality standards that have to be met. Can you discuss for a moment what it takes to be a, a U.S. participant in providing actual product to these programs that go around the world? It, it probably depends on the country and what product they're trying to make and who's going to be the recipient of that. Well, give us an example process. of the most challenging extreme and then give us an example of the simplest just to give us a feel. I can just give you an example. Uh, the U.S. probably has some of the strictest grading standards, you know, in the world as far as wheat. I can speak to wheat. Um, take Argentina, for example. They're in the uh, Mergasor with Brazil, which is similar to NAFTA. And since their close proximity, uh, the transportation is less than if we ship something there. But if we try to ship something to Brazil, uh, it's, there's a 10% 
tariff coming in there, so we're at a disadvantage there. But yet, Argentine wheat doesn't meet the specs that the Brazilians want. So they prefer to have U.S. wheat, and that happens in other countries. If, if for example, a, a flour mill has uh, Russian wheat and it doesn't quite meet their specifications, they'll buy some U.S. wheat to blend with that and strengthen it. So I don't know that I, I can specifically answer your question, but we do from start to finish. Uh, for example, our research in Kansas or in Oklahoma or wherever it is, start out with a lot of perimeters that those researchers go by. These are the things we want to end up with. Uh, they'll grow these little plants of wheat and every year they throw thousands away because they don't meet their specs. Once those things are in production, uh, we do milling and baking tests uh, based on criteria sent to us by, by the millers in the U.S. So we have to meet their specifications. Then when harvest uh, completes, Figus is in there inspecting again, and especially when shipments go out of the country. But when it goes to a foreign country, it, it's based specifically on specs coming from that position. Like if, if a certain country wants certain specs, they write it in a contract. So when it comes to the quality of the product and the nutrition programs that leave uh, the United States, yes. generally it's fair to say the recipients are assured the highest quality product. You, you will be Most getting nutrition. probably the best quality wheat in the world, and that's why we're having a problem competing with uh, the black sea wheat coming out. Uh, we can't price our quality that low. We don't want to price our quality that low. It's a better product. Uh, the, the thing you run into by buying wheat from next door, for example, in, in Africa, it'll be inconsistent. You may have some good quality wheat, you may have some poor, but what, what the world likes about U.S. wheat is the quality as well as the consistency, so they don't have to change their mills settings. The thing we are concerned about with buying next door is uh, protein content and gluten, and you're kind of mentioning that. And so our research we try to develop those strengths. So we're the, we're the most reliable source of wheat in the world, and you go visit these customers we have, and they'll tell you that. Then they're faced with the fact, can they afford it? So a lot of times they don't. But ultimately, if we're using public resources and we're trying to help our fellow citizens on the planet, we have a sense of, we have a responsibility to make sure they get the maximum benefit yes. from that. And, and that would be a point that I would add to Mr. what Mr. Evans asked. We need continued financing for ARS research as well as, as uh, private coming into it. But the ARS is very important. That's been cut back, and so the U.S. farmers had to pick up a lot of that tab, which we do. Uh, if you've ever been to the Innovation Center in Kansas that we have, uh, it's fantastic. We have. Uh, people coming in there from General Mills, uh, teaming up with our scientists there. It's, they're doing some wonderful things there. Mr. Chairman, my time's about to expire, and I yield back. Chairman, yields back. Uh, Mr. Panetta, five minutes. Could, could, excuse me, could I answer Mr. Evans' well, question? We're, we're, each, we're supposed to each get five minutes, and so we can okay. uh, submit your answer for the record uh, if you'd like to, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you. The first thing, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for not saying this earlier, I'd like to uh, introduce into the record, uh, per unanimous consent, uh, two letters that I have here. Uh, the first letter being from 121 retired three- and four-star flag and general officers from all branches of the armed services, stressing, stressing the strengthening of diplomacy and development alongside defense, uh, which are critical to keeping America safe. The second letter is from over 200 business leaders to Secretary of State Tillerson, which talks about uh, how we can advance interests over our interests overseas and support jobs here in our country uh, through the need of strong international affairs budget. Without objection. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your preparation. I appreciate your testimony and uh, being willing to come and to talk to all of us. I think, um, you know, as you've heard today uh, from many of the questions, many of the statements of uh, us on the Agriculture Committee. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I enjoy being on this committee. You find a lot of bipartisan support here 
for a number of issues uh, and that we, uh, I believe, based on the districts that we come from throughout this nation, we truly understand uh, what it means to be secure, uh, not only in this country but abroad. We understand our future food security, we understand our national security, and clearly uh, these uh, areas that you've talked of today uh, definitely demonstrate that. Uh, we appreciate you being here uh, to reinforce that. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I think it's clear that you know when it comes to uh, the United States and our affairs abroad, uh, we have a responsibility to play. Uh, and that when we don't live up to that responsibility, when we don't lead, uh, that vacuum is filled. And we've seen that over and over. Um, be it, as you mentioned, uh, in Africa with China, be it in Syria with Russia, uh, be it in South Sudan uh, with the devastation that's going on right now. I have an article in front of me that basically says if America does nothing, 50% of South Sudan's population could be gone. Uh, and so I think it's clear that you know, being American, as I've heard, being American means that we bear the burden of serving, uh, be it in this country, and be it abroad. I truly agree with that. It sounds like all of you do. I know that many of us on this Agriculture Committee agree with that as well. Uh, and so that's why you're hearing so much support for your programs. Um, but let's talk about, obviously we want to work to save your programs, but let's talk about if they were saved, give me some of the improvements that could be made. What could be improved with the programs that you spoke of today? Dr. Jane, if you could. Thank you. I appreciate your impassioned and, and well-articulated um, you know, views on that. Okay, in terms of what we could do to improve it, um, there are, in, in the long run, as, as I mentioned to, uh, in, in response to Mr. Evans, that the programs that are developing local capacity should really be the emphasis. Many of us have this image of developing countries or Africa as, as a place where there's no expertise. We have, to, we have to really fill the void ourselves to do that. Uh, that's certainly not the case anymore. It's a, a really outdated mode. I, I've, I've lived, by the way, I should mention this, of my 30 years that I've worked in this area, I've lived in Africa for seven of those years. And I've been able to see over the span of three decades the amazing increase in technical expertise that is locally there. And any kind of coherent U.S. development policy towards them is going to engage those people more directly in our programs because they can be advocates, they can influence government policy in important ways. So bringing them into the equation, uh, into our programs, is really going to be in our interests as, as well as in their interests. Uh, just in the same way that China is doing that right now. Hey, Congressman, I'd, I'd say, at least on the maritime side, we, would, we have been working very hard to increase our efficiency to try to speed up deliveries to make sure that we get food where it needs to be faster. Uh, one of the easiest things that we think USAID could do uh, would just simply be to, to start uh, to, to adopt commercial terms in, in their contracting with our, with our companies. It would make things a lot easier. Uh, it, would, it would not create the, the issues now where we're having uh, uh, very odd ways of handling the cargo and getting, and getting ships booked uh, to get them overseas. If we were using commercial terms, I think it would, it would make things a lot easier on our side and speed things up. The other thing I'd say is we, we know in advance where a lot of these famines are going to be. We've got the, the early forecasting. Uh, we've been doing a lot of warehousing and prepositioning of food overseas. I'd like to see us continue to do that uh, and, and strengthen that so that we're, we're moving things closer moving American food to positions that are easier to get in inland uh, uh, using American ships. Gentlemen, time expired. Mr. Abraham, Dr. Abraham, five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, the panel for being here. I've been many places all over the world in a previous life on humanitarian missions, and uh, I certainly understand the uh, badge of honor that we as Americans uh, carry, but that also carries responsibility and accountability. Uh, I am a advocate of President Trump's America First policy. I totally believe that when America carries the burden of food aid to these underdeveloped and unfortunate countries and these unfortunate people, that we should also bear the responsibility and the accountability of delivering this food economically and safely. I don't trust the cash. I don't trust the vouchers. I'm hopeful that we can trust the locally and regionally produced food. 
However, I think it's malpractice if we spend three to five times per bushel of wheat on a local production when we can buy more wheat American and feed more people. That seven month old that weighs seven pounds, and that may be short sighted you say on my, on my end, but that seven month old that was seven pounds, her and her mother really don't care five years down the road. They're just trying to live until tomorrow. And we need to deliver more American commodities to them with American flagged ships. It does go back to U.S. security. It does go back to national security. And it goes back to food security. Mr. Showman, uh, we have often, with wars and rumors of wars, which continue to pop up globally, have prever proverbially been caught with our pants down because we have not had the shipping to move troops and tanks and planes to areas of criticality very quickly. And that's where the merchant mariners come in, the merchant mariners. Explain, expound on that, how important that is that we can't afford to have 25 less ships than we had in previous years as far as a national security issue is concerned. Absolutely, Congressman. I, the bottom line for us is the vast majority of military cargo that goes overseas to sustain our warfighters goes on American commercial ships, not Navy Greyhulls. It's the American commercial maritime industry that carries the vast majority of these products. They need cargo in peacetime so that those ships are available and those mariners, more importantly, are available to crew those vessels. We've got approximately right now in, in, the, in the industry sailing deep sea about 11,300 mariners. That's barely enough for us to cover our commercial, sh our commercial fleet as well as the surge fleet that the Maritime Administration uh, and Department of Defense maintain. And that we can only do that for about four months at a time. Any, if we had to sus do full sustained combat operations for more than four months, we would be in, in real trouble because we don't have the mariners. And, and the issue really with, with, with these jobs is it takes a long time to grow a mariner. Each of my members sitting in the back there, they're going to they're gonna work and study for at least a year before they are ready to start an entry-level job in the industry. And to train a senior-level mariner, a captain uh, or a chief engineer, it takes 10 years plus, plus the sea time and all the accreditations, all of the licensing requirements, all the medical requirements. You can't just pick somebody up off the street and send them to war, uh, even as a merchant mariner. And we've done that in the past, and it's caused a lot of problems. I mean, World War II, we had to ramp up so quickly that it, it, to the extent that we were losing a ship a day in 1942, one in every 26 merchant mariners during World War II perished on the high seas. We cannot sustain that in a modern setting right now. If we even lost one ship, it would be catastrophic because that's how, that's how much this fleet has atrophied. So we need these programs. We need cargo preference to keep these cargo on these vessels. We need, in fact, we need more. I mean, right now we carry about 50% uh, after the MAP-21 law changed the percentage, 50% of this food aid cargo. I wish we would carry 100% of it because anything that keeps these ships moving it provides jobs for these folks that need them, that can crew these vessels in wartime, and they're absolutely critical, and we can't go to war without them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Could, could I comment? Yes, sir. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, one thing that's come up that I've noticed that kind of bothers me is that there are some uh, food for progress uh, projects that are not funded because the transportation line item has been used up. So apparently when, when the transportation of $40 million runs out, the program cease. I think perhaps we should take a look at maybe increasing that line item so that we can fulfill more of the projects that USDA has in mind. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Chairman, just back. Uh, Ms. Lisa, uh, Lisa uh, Blunt, uh, Rochester, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to the panel. Um, what's really special is to see the different uh, perspectives up here all pretty much saying the same thing in terms of the importance of, uh, of food security. And uh, I had the opportunity last month with my uh, friend and colleague, Roger Marshall, to actually have a, a conversation in a video on Global uh, World Action Week for Hunger and Famine. And it just reiterates why many of us like being on this committee, because when we have common goals, we're able to achieve some great things for our country. 
Um, as someone who's lived and worked abroad, I've worked in Ethiopia, Uganda, I've had the opportunity to live in China for four years and seen exactly what you talked about in terms of the expansion of African nations and just the, 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 the synergy that's happening there. Um, uh, this, this really is important to me because it's not just about benefiting other nations and other people, but it's also about the respect and uplifting the United States of America. Um, I have a couple of questions and I hope to get to the, the main two, but they're for the whole panel. Um, the first is um, there's been a lot of support for agriculture development from the private sector, including companies like DuPont's own, uh, Delaware's own DuPont, uh, Coca-Cola, and others. And many people think that because of this, um, there's really not a need for the government to invest in this type of work and that the private sector can do it. Uh, what would happen if the U.S. were to stop investing in agriculture development, and can the private sector make up the difference? All right, thank you so much. Um, it, it wouldn't stop the development of these areas, but it would retard the pace at which they develop. So uh, the private sector certainly is, is, is understanding that because of demographic change in the world, most of the increased demand for food is going to be in developing countries. So they see that market. Uh, but what they may not see is that the pace at which the demand grows in these countries is going to depend on the extent to which development assistance can effectively promote income growth in these countries. Because the rate of food demand is going to increase not just on population growth, but also on income growth. So to the extent that U.S. development assistance can be effective in promoting income growth, it's going to be a win-win uh, you know, for everybody, uh, for our uh, partners in Africa, as well as for our private sector partners. Great, Thank you. Great. Anybody else can jump in, or I can go to my quick second question. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, in our innovation center in Kansas, we do a lot of co-op with private and public, and see no problem with that. We share information, we share research, but I do see a problem with the public getting clear out of it. Thank you. Thank you. And then my second question is more about um, reorganization. There is a lot of reorganization happening uh, across the administration and some in the field of agriculture. And I just wanted to get your opinions on, um, as stakeholders, all of you are different stakeholders, um, could you talk a little bit about reorg for um, agriculture? Oh, Mr. Shaneman. <laughs> I was vocal about this. I, you know, I think We've had experience working with USDA for quite a number of years. We've had experience working with the USAID. Um, uh, my biggest concern with USAID is I think very, very many times they forget that the first two letters in USAID are, are US, United States, and all too often they, they're focused entirely on their mission and they don't think about any of the political realities at home or even why these programs were created in the first place. USDA, our, our work with KCCO and, and the folks in Kansas City has always been excellent. They've been great supporters of these programs for years. I think a lot of us in Maritime feel a lot more comfortable with them than we do with AID. And, and that's unfortunate because we've done our best to try to work with these folks uh, over the last 10 years. But I'll tell you, we are constantly vilified. We're constantly treated like we are starving kids because we want to create good paying jobs for Americans. And that's, and that's I don't agree with that. Uh, so from our perspective, we would love to see USDA take a larger role in PL 480. My partner and I have to have a beer later on here to kind of work this out. But in, in my view, USAID and Global Food Security Act has done tremendous things to promote development. So in line with my previous um, point, uh, the private sector and, and U.S. interests uh, broadly are well served by development in general, which is what USAID is doing. So even though uh, there may be particular aspects that uh, uh, Mr. Shoneman may be, you know, I, I may agree with him on. Uh, overall, in the, in, in the main, the development agenda that USAID has is promoting national interest uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Jim Lee yields back. Uh, Dr. Yoho, five minutes. Is your mic on? Is your mic on? It is now. <laughs> it's a tough concept. I know it. I know it is. <laughs> Welcome. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased the Agriculture Committee is holding this important hearing on future, the future of foreign aid as it pertains to the Farm Bill. And I think it's crucial that this committee and indeed all the members of the House evaluate how we structure our nation's foreign aid. The world has changed and our methods of delivering foreign aid need to change as well. We must focus on the efficiently transitioning aid recipient countries to trading partners. The, we need a paradigm shift from aid to trade. And I know a lot of people might want to uh, take a hatchet and cut foreign aid off and say we're not doing a good job. I came up here four years ago, I'm in my fifth year. I came up here to get rid of foreign aid but I've become a lot more learned in those four years. And what I've learned is what General Mattis said, if you cut foreign aid, buy more ammunition because you're gonna need it. So we need to transition and we need to be more effective at how we do what we do. And I'm the chairman of the Effective Foreign Aid Caucus. And this is something that we're very passionate about. We've done some good things in this program with um, the different farm bills and the different initiatives that have come out here, but we rely on you guys in the industry to make this more effective. And I know there's just a lot of things on the table. You know, do we put more grain over into an area or do we, you know, put more money in there? And I think we need all of the above depending on the circumstance. You know, my background is agriculture. You know, when you have an emergency situation, a humanitarian situation, you need to get food there now. But long term, I think there is a, a need to have a cash-based portion of this, but not all of it. I don't think you want to go for all of it. But the other thing I think you need to do while we're doing that, and this is where we've seen us change, is the development of a foreign um, production of food. You know, our university where I come from, uh, they're doing beef pr or meat production in northern Africa. And if I were to ask you the areas that you guys deal with the most, what continent is it? I would assume it's probably Africa. Is that correct? All right, and, and you look at the amount of money that we've put over there, um, it's in the billions of dollars, and there's 1.11 billion people that live there. 650 million people today in the 21st century don't have electricity. So you can't really help a nation if the governments aren't willing to help. So we have to pick those governments that are willing to be adaptable, and that's what I like about some of the things in OPIC and, and things like that. So to ask you what, and I'm sorry I wasn't here earlier, when you look at the, the, the way we go forward and we have the debate about do we ship raw products over there, and I'm all for supporting our American farmers, and I'm all su for supporting people in those other countries. But we have to do it to where it doesn't break the domestic market, and we've just seen the recent example with peanuts in Haiti. And I forget how many tons we dumped into Haiti, but it took the incentive from the, the indigenous farmers to stop growing peanuts because there was no market for them to market their product. So as we do this, I would like to hear from, you know, whoever best can answer this, ma'am, Miss, Miss Salem, go ahead and, and how do you direct this and how do you work, I think more importantly, work with a government to get them on the same page and that's where I like what we do with OPIC and MCC because I think they do a great job because they hold those governments accountable. What is your experience? That's a great question and, you know, as I think we, we can't have these programs eliminated but we do have to make them more efficient to some degree. And I mean, the, the world is a big place. And, and while I am in very much in support of sending things from the US, I strongly believe that it has to be a combination of the two. And in, in my industry, we actually are part of a partnership. And so we have eight factories that are locally, um, uh, local suppliers in countries like Niger, Ethiopia, uh, India, Haiti. And they're, we're, they're in malnutrition hotspots, so they can produce these types of food uh, locally. And then what we do from Odessa is we subsidize the other countries, because we can't have a factory in Syria. That doesn't make any sense. And so that by working together, by having both local production and support from the US, the, we have the flexibility to, depending on the situation, to be able to respond the most efficiently, cost-effectively, and, and the smartest way to really... I'm going to cut you off there because I'm about out of time. <laughs> With our budgetary restraints that we're facing as a nation, we have to be more effective at what we do, and we rely on you b to become more effective at that and focus on aid, not trade, and let's transition these countries off as soon as we can. Thank you. Now you'll back. How much time has expired? Um, Ms. Adams, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. Uh, you know, I've read often um, in the Bible that there are probably more than 3,000 references to how we treat the poor. 
the least of these. Uh, you know, we've always been a, a compassionate nation, and I guess sometimes if your belly doesn't growl because you're hungry, you don't, maybe you just don't understand. Uh, but having said that, um, I represent the 12th district in North, North Carolina, and, and I have uh, first, uh, no, I've seen firsthand the issues of food insecurity uh, just in my district and even my state it ranks high in food insecurity. Um, so I'm real, compa real passionate about, about this issue. Uh, having said that, with South, South Sudan and Somalia and Yemen and Nigeria facing famine for, uh, for um, conditions and, and 52 million children worldwide suffering from acute malnutrition, uh, the U.S. foreign assistance is crucial, and, and I certainly appreciate all the comments that you all have made in, in support of that. Uh, Ms. Schuler, uh, international food aid has been a critical component of United States foreign policy with bipartisan support for over six decades, and I, I'm real delighted to be on this committee because of the bipartisan um, um, compassion that we, that we seem to have. And then President Reagan, when signing the proclamation establishing World Food Day, said that all Americans can be proud of our country's continuing efforts to battle world hunger. Uh, President Trump's budget, however, would zero out the severely cut funding for those vital international uh, programs. And uh, with the long tradition of bipartisan support for these programs, do you feel that there is justification for abruptly zeroing out these programs? Uh, no, I, I do not feel there's justification. I think it would be a, a huge mistake. It would impact millions of people, and it would damage our reputation as a country um, almost immediately. Um, so I, I, as I've said before, I, I think these programs are some of the best, um, uh, best, uh, most effective programs in terms of helping millions of people, and, um, and I think they absolutely need to be kept, um, yeah. Thank you. You, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that, that 70 million people worldwide would face severe food insecurity, and, and thank you for bringing that um, to our attention. I want, Mr. Seps, uh, you were not able to respond to a question of my colleague here, so I wanted to g give my brother an opportunity to get that back in. But what would you, in, in terms of the question that he asked about uh, the, the top issue for our consideration as we consider the farm bill that will be expiring in September. If you'd like to comment, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Well, first of all, I'm here because I think monetization is very important. Uh, in fact, currently planting sorghum right now and my tractor is idle. So that's how important I think it is. I need to be here to talk to you about it. The other thing is getting off topic a little bit. You're talking about the farm program. Uh, we need to really take a look at crop insurance, and that's the only thing I really have to hang my hat on as far as a farmer. Uh, it, it helps keep me, whatever the word sustainable means, it keeps me there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned before, research, ARS research in, in wheat, we need to continue that. We've been cutting back. And uh, in cutting back, then it throws the burden over to the the farmer himself, which is okay, we're willing to pick some of that up, but it also goes to the private companies, and as long as we have a kind of an equal representation there, we're in pretty good shape, mm -hmm. so. Great, well, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back my few minutes. The lady yields back. Uh, Dr. Marshall, you cleaned up? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm ready to go. All right. Um, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Soups, you and I live in the, the largest agriculture producing district in the country. We grew up in the backyard of one of the co-authors of the McGovern Dole Bill, or as we call it, the Dole McGovern Bill back home. And, and despite that, we, we, have, we literally have mountains of grain and nowhere to go with them. And, and despite that, we have food insecurities in our own district, in our own state, and, and in our own world. Uh, you chose to be here. Most of your colleagues are back home planting sorghum, as you, as you just said and you've been overseas, why do you do this? What's your passion? What drives you? Well, I, I think just being a farmer and being outdoors and being an agriculturist, a conservationist, an economist, and a humanitarian probably brings me to that. Uh, I can only imagine, I've been in enough countries representing farmers through U.S. wheat that I've seen a lot of this stuff, 
not necessarily food aid, but talking to flour millers. And as you're in country, you can, you can see what's going on in Africa, in Nigeria, or, or these other countries, and, and you're thinking, well, the U.S. has a presence there in a lot of places. We probably need more. So I suppose my exposure to those things has brought me here. Okay, thank you. Ms. Salem, I looked at your package here, and there's one ingredient missing. Mr. Soup's there has the highest protein content of wheat in the world that he grows. And we just want to make a, a, a little push to get some wheat in there. Um, I want to ask you kind of the same question. You, you're basically a, a, a volunteer for your organization. What's your passion? What brought you here to start this company? Um, one thing, uh, being a mom. So I have four daughters, uh, but my family is from Tanzania, the last three generations. And I have seen too many times firsthand what it looks like to lose a child. And to hear those sounds and, and to sit with a mother who's lost her child. And that is the only reason I'm here. That is the only reason I get up every morning to take on this fight, which is never easy. Um, it's for those mothers who've had to lose children for the most ridiculous reason. Yeah. We know how to treat severe acute malnutrition. It doesn't take any research. It just takes will and action to make it happen. Thanks. Thanks for your passion. I, I too, have been blessed to be travel to places from Haiti to Africa. And typically, I saw more Quash-Yorker syndrome as opposed to Merasmus. And I'm just curious, in, in the world, the places you're treating, are you seeing more of one versus the other? Is it more protein or is it more calorie-based uh, nutrition issues? Or You're getting very technical now, Mr. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I think that what we're trying to do is we, we don't just make this one product. We make an entire okay. range, um, about eight, and we're obviously and uh, very focused also on innovation, too. So we're looking at all of the different issues that are going on from prevention of malnutrition for under twos, severe acute, moderate acute, chronic, stunting, pregnant and lactating women. So we're really looking at all of the different issues and trying to design specific um, products that can help uh, design nutritional outcomes that are measurable and high, have um, clinical trials along with it to be able to prove these outcomes. So whatever the problem is, we are looking at solutions um, and in innovative solutions and willing to work with partners on the ground who are seeing different things coming up to make sure that we are able to create something that can work well in the field. So you see, is, it, uh, is there more a protein deficiency uh, in Africa or in Haiti, or is it more just caloric intake? At, at this point, I'd say more caloric um, okay. because of the, the droughts. And when you add a drought plus war, you're, you're really just lacking food in general. Not as much the diet diversity is maybe what we're seeing more in Central America. Okay. There's not a better protein source, of course, than Kansas beef. Uh, have you guys tried <laughs> tried to do anything with, uh, with beef as far as... Uh, you know, a prepared product like this, is it just too costly? Yeah. Certainly it's, it's, it's uh, an incredible protein source. Right. It's definitely a cost issue. Um, and peanuts are something that are grown here, but also in, in uh, all over Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Latin America, too. So these types of formulas are being able to be produced locally um, and here as well. So beef might knock us out of the... Uh, well, I think it's... So a big chunk of your expenses is cost. It, is, uh, it sounds like transportation. Uh, like is that fifty percent of the product? Uh, we're getting it from point A to B is 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 that is it a, is no. transportation a big chunk of it? I mean, if you're if you're shipping a container that's valued at, with about sixty thousand dollars worth of product, um, oh. an average shipping cost would be five thousand dollars. Okay. So it's not the the majority is is spent on the food. All right. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Soto. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, a lot of us are concerned that we're at a real crossroads with regard to American leadership abroad, um, whether it was with uh, tepid support of NATO, whether it was the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, or now with the uh, elimination or proposed elimination of the McGovern Dole Food for Education program. But for argument's sake, let's start with America first. Uh, I'd like to ask first Mr. Supps, uh, with regard to domestic hunger, do we have enough of our commodities remaining in the United States to be able to feed the United States like wheat or other key commodities? There's no problem there. Okay. 
And then uh, Dr. Jane, uh, what would you say are the current causes of domestic hunger? Is it the foreign aid program or are there are other factors? No, I don't think it has anything to do with the foreign aid program. It's uh, purchasing power issues, uh, access to cash to purchase food. There's, there is some significant poverty in this country. And then let's turn to American jobs that would be lost. Uh, Mr. Schoenemann, what would be the number of jobs lost uh, among our seafarers if uh, this program is eliminated? It's, it's hard to say. I, it would depend on the number of, of, of ships that were lost, but I'll tell you, we've lost about 2,400 just in the last five years since we changed uh, the percentage that we carry. But the, the, the maritime industry alone accounts for hundreds of thousands of jobs, direct and indirect, uh, that are involved specifically in, in this program. And those jobs would, would probably go away if, if these programs went away. So are we talking about hundreds of jobs, thousands of jobs, or tens of thousands of jobs, just as an estimate? I would say at least tens of thousands, if not more. And then go into um, keeping America safe. If we pull away from uh, these programs, uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Schuler and Ms. Salem, who would fill this vacuum and what effect would it be on uh, making America safe? Well, as I talked about Somalia, I mean, Somalia is one of the countries where the U.S. is, is fighting hard against uh, a terrorist group, Al-Shabaab, where we've seen many attacks in Kenya and in Ethiopia and elsewhere. Um, they would fill the gap. If we, if we pulled out of Somalia with our assistance, um, kids, young people, people who felt there was no hope, they would turn toward those, those uh, terrorist groups, and uh, I think America would be a loser. And would it be fair to say that there would be an increase in piracy among Somalians and others who in the past have made that region unstable? Possibly, yeah. And then what is your opinion, Ms. Salem, who would fill the void for a lot of these uh, programs if we left? Yeah, I mean, I agree. One of the areas that we're very involved in is uh, in Nigeria. And in, in the north, when Boko Haram was defeated and humanitarian aid workers went in, they found 250,000 severely malnourished kids. That means that's a quarter of a million people who are uh, basically near death. And so this, this is what the terrorists are doing to, to people in these countries. And so we, we need to continue to fight to be the leader in those regions and, and defeat that way of thinking. And we have another question. Thank you. And Mr. <laughs> Seps, I want to go back to emerging markets for agriculture. Uh, we had a great growing season, but prices were low. Uh, how do you think this would affect growth in agriculture going forward if we didn't lead in with some of these food aid programs in emerging markets? Well. It's, it's uh, probably not the place to talk about rankings, but uh, as far as exports? As if, far as growth if, in exports okay, I'll, I'll, based upon the lead-in of these programs. If you put together all the food aid programs that we currently do in a year and take the wheat and add the wheat all up, uh, wheat in my area would amount to probably the fourth largest customer that I have, which would be called food aid. If you look at the Pacific Northwest, uh, that would be about number 10th as far as a customer. Now, it's, we're not here to look at customers, but eventually after you produ uh, produce food aid for these people, a lot of those countries do end up becoming our customers. And let's wrap so, it up with one last question. What type of job loss do you think would happen um, among, for instance, our wheat industry uh, if this program uh, was eliminated? Well, you're looking at uh, elevator systems, you're looking at rail, rail lines that handle the commodity, you're looking at the maritime, it's, it's all connected. Uh, you might even lose a few more farmers. So Thank you're you. talking about a lot of jobs. Thank you. Mr. Mastavi expired. Uh, Mr. Allen, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today to tell your stories and experiences on how uh, international food aid programs are important to uh, your organization and how they continue to boost various sectors of the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, with the new administration, we have heard a different approach and platform, and we've heard it here today about uh, America first. I think uh, the equivalent of that would be, uh, certainly I would want to donate to your worthy cause, but I think it would be uh, improper for me to go to the bank and borrow the money to donate to you and have my children co-sign that note. 
uh, and have them pay that debt at some point in time. So uh, that's just an illustration of where this country is. And um, you know, as you know, for years we have historically been a leading provider in international food aid. And as some of you mentioned, your organization is just that, American agriculture commodities uh, grown and harvested by American farmers. And, uh, and I want to thank you for highlighting uh, that today uh, in your discussion. Mr. Uh, Schumann, um, I was particularly interested in hearing your testimony as it provided, and we touched on it, uh, about the U.S. flagged vessels and uh, the reduction uh, of those uh, U.S. flagged uh, vessels. I mean, is this being, uh, is this a politically correct issue? <laughs> what the heck? I mean, if it's our food and we're sending it over there, shouldn't it be on our ships? Absolutely. I, I don't think it's a politically correct issue. It all comes down to money. I think that's the real, the real concern. Okay. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, we are the quiet service. We do our jobs, our members, we go to work every day. I go to work every day to make sure my members go to work every day. Uh, unless something bad happens, you don't usually hear about the maritime industry. We, get our, we, we keep our heads down and we get our work done. Uh, and that has made it very easy, uh, unfortunately, in some of these debates uh, to use us as a pay for, uh, or use us as, as, a, as, a, as a means of, of, uh, of trying to balance something out somewhere else. MAP 21 is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. That was a transportation bill in 2012. Um, under a deal that was cut back in the 1980s, we were to carry 75% of all food aid cargoes. That was reduced by 50%, by 25% to 50% in MAP 21. And in addition to that, uh, in, the next, in the next year's budget, uh, there was a program called Ocean Freight Differential that essentially would require the federal government, the Maritime Administration, to reimburse uh, USDA, the Food for Peace program, for whatever the difference was in the cost of transporting uh, all this grain on American ships versus what it would have cost them if it was foreign. It was mandatory spending. It was automatic. There was never an issue. Uh, but unfortunately, the Budget Committee hates mandatory spending, and that was something that they zeroed out. So now we have a self-fulfilling prophecy of transportation costs are going up, and the result is, is because we're not, we're not covering those. Okay. So it's, it's difficult for, for us when we're looking at this program we, we see that the, the appropriations have stayed about flat, and the amount of money we're spending on transportation is going up. The amount of money we're spending on food is going down. We need to find ways to fix this, but cutting the mariners out of it is, 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 is horrible for national security. So how are we getting the food over there? Well, I mean, that's, that's part of the problem. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the, of, of the new flexibility ideas that, that folks have put out there is to, is to either provide cash. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been told that that's a, a very minuscule amount of money, but it's still more money than it's going to buy food. We have vouchers. We, we're buying food locally, but then it's being shipped uh, on foreign flag vessels from the port of origin over there, not from on American ships. Uh, and un unfortunately, since we're only carrying half, we'd love to remind USAID that, that the 50 percent is a minimum, not a maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, they, can, they can carry as much, we can carry as much cargo as they want to give us. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, they do their best to try to keep it at that 50 percent right. level, and that makes it hard. Going on, uh, Ms. Shuler, Ms. Salem, of course, you, and thank you for your work. Uh, it's amazing what you're doing there with uh, Ms. Uh, Salem with your business. And uh, just one last question. Uh, you know, in this country, we have an obesity problem. In this country, I think we waste more food than we eat, and there are people starving around the world. I mean, why can't we solve this? Right. I mean, you bring up a, a great point. If, if we were able to eliminate the waste alone, um, we would be able to feed the whole world a couple times over. I mean, we're wasting 30 percent um, of all food that's... that's uh, and to get our U.S. fleet to take it over to these countries <laughs> well, that are starving. Well, I hope it's not wasting. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, great. Ms. Uh, Sheila, you got any closing comments? Um, well, I think uh, I would just say that in, in many countries, you also have issues related to conflict. Many of the, many of the countries that we're talking about that have huge food uh, assistance needs are, are countries with conflict. So we need to work together right. to work yeah. with government. We're up leadership, yeah. And provide exactly. leadership to solve those crises. Good, good. Thank you. I'll yield. Mr. Stiles expired. Uh, Mr. Lawson, five minutes. Uh, thank you, and, uh, and, and I've learned a great deal. Uh, from you all this morning, uh, because I have not been involved in international uh, food programs. Uh, heard a whole lot about them, uh, but to just listen to uh, 
you all uh, has been very uh, stimulating. Uh, one of the uh, aspects that uh, that I'm concerned about is two things I'm concerned about is one, what I heard uh, might have been Ms. Salem talk about how China trains uh, uh, some of the people from Africa uh, in their language uh, and then um, they go back and they come back again and they eventually are going to be leaders uh, in uh, their country and so forth. How does that affect us in America? Yeah, okay, thank you. I think that was me. Um, so China observes an opportunity in developing countries and as you know, they're, they're, they're going for it. <laughs> Uh, they're investing heavily in both soft and hard forms of, of infrastructure, training, and all of this. So how is that affecting the United States? It sort of depends on how the United States responds. Uh, if the United States responds recognizing that these opportunities for win-win situations, uh, and they go after those opportunities through the programs of USAID and uh, USDA and um, you know, the, 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 the kind of programs that we're looking at here, we have an opportunity to, uh, to, to get the America first objectives, which many people here have kind of talked about, we can get those objectives through a U.S. development assistance program that's well articulated. So uh, I would say that, uh, you know, even if the uh, view is just America first, it is in America first interests to get out there and promote development uh, in other countries because our private sector is going to win from that. Uh, so, so response, China is doing what is in China's best interests uh, and uh, how can we fault them for that? Uh, it would just be, a, a, it would be unfortunate if all of the opportunities available for the United States to benefit from uh, promoting trade and development in Africa that we don't take advantage of that. And I think that's where we're at risk uh, if we uh, don't uh, carry forward some of the programs that uh, have been discussed during this session. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, if, if you remember, George W. Bush uh, was seen as a leader on HIV and AIDS and uh, across Africa, for example, and people still talk about that in Africa, how great of a job the U.S. did in terms of helping to um, reduce the impact and mitigate the impact of HIV AIDS. Um, why can't why can't we be a leader in, in, in ending hunger and, um, and, and being a leader in the world in that regard? And I think that would be a beautiful way to strengthen the U.S. reputation around the world and, and, and help the America First cause. Okay. Uh, if, uh, if we can uh, still be a leader in the Food for Progress program, uh, which increases our capacity around the world, who are we in competition with? Is that just where we want to be? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, one of the um, questions that we frequently hear people say is, why should we promote agricultural development in countries? They're just going to take away our markets and compete with us. Well, if you look at the kind of crops that are exported out of Africa, it's usually cocoa, tea, coffee, cut flowers, tropical fruits, to a lesser extent, cotton, okay? These, with the exception of cotton, none of these other crops really compete with our U.S. exports. So that's why it's increasingly a win-win to promote development in both areas. They're very compatible and synergistic with each other. So our farmers stand, our farmers and our broader agribusiness community stand to gain a lot by development in these, in these areas of the world. Okay. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Thank you. Mr. Goodlatte, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this has been a very good hearing, and I really appreciate all of your participation. Uh, and I agree with uh, some of what almost all of you have said. Uh, I agree with Dr. Jane that uh, food uh, uh, production in these countries and sustainability is absolutely critical. We've got to have that. Uh, but I also agreed with Mr. Shaneman and uh, our wheat grower and I probably Ms. Salem that as much of this as we can do to promote growth in the United States of support for this program by uh, producing it, processing it, and shipping it uh, from the United States 
to handle uh, emergency food aid is vitally important to keep the support for this program, uh, or you're going to see more and more public support for the kind of proposals that do completely cut these programs off. So Dr. Jane, let me start with you. Uh, I, I am uh, concerned about the efficiency of some of these programs that are that are run to encourage that production. I've been to Ethiopia as well. I've been to schools, uh, just like the chairman has, seen uh, uh, children being fed, uh, very, uh, I think, nutritious and also some pretty inexpensive uh, food that gets them to school and gets them through the day. But then as I drove there, I saw the most archaic, and this is in Ethiopia, a beautiful farmland uh, being farmed with with, with animals, basically. You know, I saw very little mechanized equipment. Uh, what uh, is USAID doing? And are there other U.S. government programs, or is it primarily relying upon USAID to get uh, a place like that uh, modernized and more efficient so they can take advantage of that farmland and produce for their own people? Yeah, great question. Uh, USAID, I, I believe, is uh, is doing the bulk of USAID, U.S. government programs towards development assistance, and of course, you know the fact that you how see, efficient are they? Yeah. I, I get the impression that a lot of money is wasted. I've been to Haiti too, uh, where we appropriated the Congress appropriated two billion dollars, not just for food aid, but for uh, rebuilding a you know a, mm -hmm. a devastated yes. country that was was the worst in in the Western Hemisphere before the earthquake and then just totally devastated after the earthquake. Yeah. And I see a lot of waste. What's, mm -hmm. what's going on? Well, certainly um, almost all of these programs could be made more efficient. Uh, that, that's true. Um, one example uh, I can give you right off is that um, our capacity building programs, which are designed to train uh, the next generation of scientists locally and extension workers and farmers locally, that can be done much more efficiently. Are we paying Americans to go over and do this like the Chinese uh, are doing? Are we bringing uh, people from these countries to the U.S. like the Chinese? We're mostly bringing them to the U.S. and it costs uh, $65,000 a year to bring someone overseas into a land-grant U.S. Uh, system for training, 65 per year. Why? Uh, it costs about um, 7,000 per year to train someone uh, locally, and we're, we're starting... But is it a U.S. person going over there to train them? Because yes. I, I want the U.S. to get credit for of this. Of course, yes. And, and we're, we're, we're needing to innovate, and we're seeing ways in which we need to partner more with universities overseas, develop kind I, of strategic I, I want to ask uh, Ms. Salem a question, sure. too, as well. I'm, I just really... I'd never heard of this before. I think it's <laughs> phenomenal. I'm really impressed. Uh, and I'm interested in knowing... Um, uh, what you think about what overall percentage of U.S. food aid should be fortified, nutrient-dense products uh, like those produced by Adesia? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, our product is not a silver bullet for hunger. We're really focused on very specific cases of malnutrition, uh, specifically moderate Immediate, and Immediate, get it there quickly, can be prepositioned. But also for the right people. So you want, you want the bulk grains to be used for adults and, and, and people who don't fall into the most vulnerable categories. We want to save this just for those that are really at the brink of death, who are in clinics, who need, it's like a food by prescription. So think of it as a medical food versus grains. So that's, the, that's really what we need to be using these for, not for the masses. Um, and let me so ask, Miss, uh, how do you pronounce your name, sir? Supus. 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 Uh, in, it's like it looks. In Tanzania, uh, the wheat that we sent over there to that flour mill, it's a very large flour mill, is of course fortified, and they told us that they were selling this to the underprivileged at a cheaper rate. You're happy to rate. sell it uh, over there. You're happy to sell it to the U.S. government to distribute over there, and you're also happy to sell it to Ms. Salem, right? So, so she Absolutely. Could she could make crackers okay. and put this peanut butter in between. Right. It would be right. phenomenal. Yeah. All right. So my many question. new ideas. Right. My, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Chairman of the uh, Nutrition Subcommittee, uh, Gene Top T. T. Thompson. Chairman, thank you. Thank you for all the members of the panel. Uh, very, uh, very important um, hearing that we're having. Nutrition does matter. Certainly matters here at home, and it matters overseas in areas where, uh, um, uh, you know, we've talked about what we can do to improve. But is, I mean, I happen to believe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just naive. I've been accused of that on occasion. I happen to believe the United States has been the uh, the most effective force for good 
of putting food in the bellies of hungry people overseas. Is that, am I wrong? Am I naive on that? We're looking at how we can improve, right? But we're not really here to, to uh, uh, mourn the fact that we, um, that we have failed. Um, I, I think that we should be very proud of what this nation uh, has done, what American farmers and farm families have provided. Uh, uh, I actually think that's a, I'm a little biased, I'm being from a pretty rural area. I think that's a, um, looking out for your neighbors is sort of a characteristic of uh, rural America. I always say the best part of living in a, in a, a rural community is that uh, um, everybody knows your business. Um, the worst part is everybody knows your business. <laughs> Um, and the fact is that we do uh, have an impact around the world. I want to come back to the, how we get things there briefly. Uh, Mr. Showman, um, and you've talked about this a little bit. It's my understanding that, that our agricultural and maritime communities have developed an enduring bipartisan partnership in these programs. Uh, how would this partnership be impacted by proposals to turn these programs into more overseas cash handouts, which I have concerns with when I look at the news headlines over the past 10, 12 years. I mean, I know food winds up in hungry bellies. Cash sometimes winds up different places. Um, uh, or perhaps a voucher program or, or by weekend cargo preference requirements. How would that, Im that impact support for funding these programs? What we have been telling folks for the last 10 years is if you remove the domestic constituency between the American farmer and the American mariner, the PVOs and the other organizations that provide this aid, these programs are going to die. They are going to get zeroed out. It's, it's, it's an inevitability. Because when you look at these programs, if there's not a domestic support for them politically, then what do they become? As Mr. Yoho and, and Mr. Allen pointed out, they're, they're just giveaway programs. And we do a lot of We don't have the money to do it anymore. Uh, as the chairman said, we're $20 trillion in debt. If we're going to be, if we're going to be spending our, our taxpayer dollars, it has to be on something that has a domestic benefit. You cut out the political constituencies for these programs at home, they're going to go away. And I think the, the president's budget is, is a perfect example of that. Uh, no other president has ever taken a shot at McGovern Dole and, and PL 480 the way that President Trump did. And I think the only reason he was able to do that is because we've so undermined the domestic program uh, that we've cut out the Americans in it uh, and it makes it easy to cut away. So I'm very concerned if, if we do not put the Americans back in this program that these programs are going to go away, period. Um, can you elaborate on the efforts made by shippers to ensure efficient delivery? You've made reference to this, but I wonder if you could flush that out a little more. To, 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 efforts to ensure efficient delivery of food aid cargoes in emergency situations. And are there other steps that could be taken to improve the speed of delivery of U.S. in-kind commodities during emergencies? As I noted uh, earlier, uh, you know, I think if we, if we can try to mirror the commercial industry's practices in the food aid sector, that would make things much easier on our guys trying to, to, to handle the inland transportation as well as the port transportation, getting them on the ships. Commercial terms would be a big impact on that. The prepositioning, doing more prepositioning, I think would be, would be beneficial so that we can cut down on the travel times. Uh, and then, I, frankly, a lot, of the, a lot of the issues that I see is just trying to, is USAID and others trying to play the game of how do we get to that 50% threshold and, and those types of things. If we simply carried all the cargo, it would make it much easier. Uh, so I think from, from that perspective, um, if we were able to uh, increase the percentage that we carry and then we can work together with USAID to find creative ways to be innovative and, and to move things faster, I'm fully confident that the industry can do that. And we look forward to working with them to do that in the future. Thank you. Ms. Schuller, um, based on your experience in the field, do you believe PVOs are currently able to provide um, the appropriate mix of food aid uh, modalities in response to the world hunger needs while protecting against fraud and abuse? Yes, I, I think um, that the PVO community is working very hard on looking at ways to um, hold uh, partners accountable and communities accountable and, and their own agencies. World Vision, for example, has a program called um, Citizen Voice in Action, and it also it, it actually engages people at the community level to, to hold their governments, to hold other partners accountable. And this is a great tool and has been very successful in, in reducing fraud um, with food aid programs programs, but also with other programs. Thank you, Chairman. Jim's time expired. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, what a terrific panel today. Uh, each of you have brought a face and a, vo and a, and a perspective uh, to uh, this important issue, and, uh, and I appreciate you coming to D.C. to make that happen. 
Uh, Sonny Perdue, our new Secretary of Ag, has uh, got a new motto for USDA, it's do right and feed everybody. Uh, and clearly that's uh, on the front of your minds. Uh, this is a hard subject. Uh, in addition to the to our going to see the Magol Dovern program and the Mercy program, uh, we also went to Jordan to see the, the voucher cast assistance program at a, in a Syrian refugee camp just south of the Syrian border. Uh, you don't go into a refugee camp uh, of some 80,000 people and come out the same person that you went in. Uh, and those vouchers actually were being used to buy U.S. rice. It was in commercial, you know, smaller packages uh, in the grocery store that was uh, set up in order to do this. So uh, there's a, it's going to be a blend of, uh, of cash and products, and, and, and every one of you made good points. Uh, and, and the, you know, the going back through the entire uh, uh, um, uh, hearing is not appropriate this second, but, but you did good stuff. Whether it's, uh, you know, one of the references Ms. Adams made to, uh, cry, uh, to the poor in the Bible uh, Christ said, the poor, you will, have, you will have the poor with you always. Uh, you're not going to be able to work your way out of a job. Uh, we're going to always have the poor with us, and, and it's going to be some responsibility. We all bear some responsibility in feeding them, whether it's reaction to national disasters, droughts, hur you know, hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, other things that happen where uh, things happen, or it's in response to man's inhumanity to man, uh, the wreck in Venezuela. But, uh, that's just, just a government that that uh, mistreated its people, corruption, mismanagement, whatever it is in these countries that, that have these problems. Uh, we as Americans, with the blessings we have, do have a responsibility to, to, uh, to assist where we, uh, where we can. As I also mentioned, we've got uh, uh, tough, tough sledding ahead for our own country. We don't have an unlimited checkbook, even though it appears that way, uh, we don't. And, uh, and so using uh, the wisdom of Solomon to try to figure out how we continue to do the the very best we need to do around the world and, and create that leadership that everyone talks about. America is a leader. You don't hear any other country who is referenced in response to these kinds of issues the way America is, is referenced. And, and, and that's a point of pride for us. We've done good stuff around the world, as GT mentioned, and we will continue to do it, whether it's through governments or uh, Salem and, and the private sector doing what you do best. Um, we're going to continue to help, and uh, and each of you have uh, helped us this morning gain a better understanding of uh, of how tough this is going to be, and uh, and so please please uh, pray for our decision makers because these are going to be hard things to you know priorities to set and hard things to do that are coming at us a whole lot quicker than maybe we even thought of them to uh, do it. So again, what a great panel you were this morning. So thank each of you very very much. Under the rules of the days, uh, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing. We'll be made open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses. Should any of the witnesses want to respond to something that you needed to get into the record, we'll take that. Uh, for any uh, question posed by the member, this hearing on the Committee of Agriculture adjourned. Thank you all.